Welcome everyone today, today to today's strategic planning meeting of East Ryan Yorkshire Council. Apologies for the slightly delayed start. We were having issues with technical things and getting logged into YouTube, but we are now all up and running, which is good. I'm Councillor Leo Hammond, Chairman of the Committee and today's meeting. To my left is the Planning Officer, Andy Wainwright, and whilst his colleague, James Chatfield, Tom Booth Robinson and Danielle Keary, and Highways Officer Scott Richardson are also in the chamber. To my right is John Wiley from Democratic Services. The Council Solicitor, Gemma Percy, is also in the chamber, as well as members of the Planning Committee and the public. We also have with us remotely members of the public who are speaking on applications that are being considered today. Arrangements for dealing with planning applications will be as follows. Firstly, officers' summary and updates will be given. Secondly, items involving attendance by members of the public will be dealt with first, and speakers are restricted to five minutes each, with a warning when 30 seconds remains. Speakers are not permitted to circulate additional information, including photographs, plans, or petitions during today's meeting. Any councillor not on the committee who has also requested to speak today will also be provided five minutes. Members of the committee are to note the information given by officers and speakers. Any decision proposed which is contrary to the recommendations contained within the report will require reasons if the proposal is to refuse and reasons and conditions if the proposal is to approve the application. In accordance with the Council's equality policy, speakers are asked to refrain from making any comments which could be construed as being discriminatory or defamatory, otherwise I will have to intervene. Additionally, I would add, ask everybody here today that although differing opinions on items may be expressed, that we all respect each other's views. Please ensure mobile phones are switched on to silent to avoid any disruption to the meeting. And also, whilst you are not speaking, either here in the chamber or on Zoom, could you ensure that you are on mute? The fire procedure for today will be as follows. If the alarm sounds, attendees will be directed where to go. Please follow the instructions given by officers. We'll now move on to the agenda in full. The first item on today's agenda is declarations of non-pecuniary, pecuniary and prejudicial interests and declarations under section four of the code of practice for dealing with planning applications. Members of the, of the committee are now to declare interest, but before I open up to the floor, there were a few organized site visits for the a few items on this committee today. So could I ask that the members who attended the site visit for item seven at Brands Burton, please raise their hands. You got that, and item five and six at Driftfield, could you please raise your hand? Thank you. Brands Burton for Councillor Courtney Sue. Are there any other declarations of interest from members? Councillor Whittle. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've received communication uh, regarding uh, item seven on the agenda. Uh, I have not responded to said communications. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, um, like Councillor Whittle, uh, item seven, I've had uh, correspondence from uh, or emails from objectors, but have not responded to them. Thank you, Councillor Road. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, on item agenda number five, I have had a previous site visit on that, not with the, the, the agreed one. Um, on agenda item seven, um, I also have had um, uh, objectors sending information through to me, which I have not commented on. And finally, on agenda item number nine, page 55, under uh, section four of the Code of Conduct, I have to declare that over 12 years ago, I did support a campaign against an onshore wind farm. Since then, um, with the changes in technology, etc., I have now no predetermination uh, on these matters and feel able to, uh, to discuss the application freely um, uh, on this existing wind farm change of use. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, firstly, just to say apologies, I was unable to attend the site visit. I was in a separate meeting, uh, two actually, that had already been booked well in advance and couldn't be in two places at once. However, I have been contacted regarding items five, six, seven and ten. Uh, I only got these in the last couple of days and quite frankly didn't have time to reply, so therefore can't be predetermined. I just wanted to use this opportunity to let residents know that despite my lack of reply, I did receive these and did read them all. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Healy. Yeah, item seven. Uh, I have also received correspondence uh, in respect of that item. 
I didn't respond. I have read it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Coulthage. Thank you, Chairman. Likewise, correspondence on agenda item seven, but I didn't respond. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Same as those two. Thank you. And Councillor McMaster. Thank you, Chair. Seven and ten have received correspondence. No comments passed. Thank you. Then just for me, uh, John, I too received correspondence on item seven, but have not expressed a view. And then on item 10, uh, as a ward member, I have been quite active against the prison at Full Sutton and also subsequently since it's been approved, the campaign to get additional mitigation and things for the prison. So I will actually declare a, a, a predetermined nation interest in that application and will relinquish the chair to Councillor McMaster. I will, however, address the meeting as a ward councillor from down there, and then I will leave the room. Oh, I can do it from up here. Okay, I'll say sat in my not so comfy chair actually, but um, I'll, I'll do it from up here, and then I will leave uh, before that before Councillor McMaster takes over and, and the committee addresses that application. Okay, thank you, members. Item two is to approve as a correct record. The minutes of the committee meeting held on the 26th of May 2022, which is pages one to five of our PACs. Is everyone happy with those minutes? Councillor Master, are you proposing? And Councillor Rudd, are you seconding? Yep, all those in favour of those minutes? Everybody's in favour. Uh, item three is to receive the minutes of the undermentioned subcommittees as follows. Firstly, Eastern Area Planning of the 16th of May 2022, pages 6 to 16 of our report. Are members happy with those minutes? Councillor Healy, are you proposing? Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Jump, all those in favour? Then item two is Western Area Planning of the 17th of May 2022, pages 17 to 18 of our report. Are all members happy with those minutes? Councillor Ruddy proposing? And Councillor Merritt a second. All those in favour? Carried. Uh, item four, withdrawals. Do we have any withdrawals? No withdrawals. We'll then move on to the applications. Before we open the first application, I will just say that obviously we've got a long agenda today with over an hour's worth of speakers and it's quite hot in here. So I think at the relevant time, we will probably have a break so members can uh, refresh and, and have some air. So the first item is item five, which is at the land south of Long Lane, Driffield, pages 19 to 58 of our report. Can we have the officer's update, please? Uh, thank you so much, Chair, if everyone can hear me. Um, this is a development for up to 200 houses on an allocated site. Access to the site is proposed to be gained by three routes, from Cemetery Lane to the south, from Long Lane to the north, and from the east through the remaining part of the allocation, which is yet to be developed. On-site provision is to be made for a new plane pitch with car parking and changing and storage facilities being shown. A viability assessment has been provided and agreed by the council's valuation officers, which has demonstrated that the scheme is only viable to be developed with a 15% affordable housing. However, the scheme overall is to provide section 106 contributions, legal agreement contributions uh, in excess of one million pound, which would include education and highways infrastructure contributions, actually substantial highways infrastructure contributions. Officers have recommended this application um, be deferred back to officers to secure amendments required by the Council's Highway Control Officers and to secure Section 106 agreement contributions through the legal agreements. Once these have been addressed, it's recommended the scheme be, um, be approved in line with delegated approval. Um, an amended plan, uh, layout plan has also been submitted showing two equipped children's play park areas on site measuring 568 square metres. And that dissatisfies paragraph 7.36 of the committee report which discusses the justification for not providing quit space on site. And as such, this, this can be disregarded and, can be, and that space can be secured through the 106 agreement. Uh, since the paper's been published, we've had an additional comment from Driffield, Town, uh, Driffield Junior Football Club, and they raised the following points. That the uh, inference to a clubhouse is incorrect, as, they may just prove to, as, um, as it may just prove to be storage and changing facilities. Section 9 of recommendation does not make specific reference to the need to secure sports provision within the 106 agreement. The football club is currently awaiting the outcome of a planning application for their own storage and changing facilities. Condition 19 requires a submission of details for the sports facilities by the provision of 150th dwelling. However, it's imperative that details of this provision are provided at an earlier stage and the provisional facilities should, make, should be made at the earliest possible opportunity in order to prioritise the current lack of investment in low facilities in the locality. 
Uh, members, for clarification, as noted, paragraph 7.36 of your report, the reason for deferral, as mentioned earlier, should also include reference to the inclusion of a contribution to the upgrade and facilities of the existing facilities for the football club in lieu of the on lieu, sorry, in lieu of the on-site change in facilities, if that's deemed to be necessary. Two additional letters have also been received, but do not raise any further issues which are not currently reported in, in the pack. But further consultation responses, Humber Archaeology have confirmed that the use of condition is appropriate as to the deferral as previously recommended. And housing strategy have confirmed that the proposed mix and layout in terms of affordable housing is acceptable to them. In terms of the report itself, uh, paragraph 1.2 states that Long Lane will, be closed, will eventually be closed off to vehicular traffic. However, for clarification, that this is now not to be the case as set out for the reasons within the, in the main body of the report. As the report goes on to explain, the access will remain open and the new access proposed from Cemetery Lane, and this has been agreed with highways. Uh, paragraph 7.39, uh, unfortunately, it does include a typing error, and this with regard to housing mix, and this should re read that the proposed mix would be 16 one-bedroom houses, 41 two-bedroom houses, 83 three-bedroom houses, and 60 four-bedroom houses. Um, however, this does not affect the overall assessment as carried out in paragraph 7.40 and 7.42, which reach, reach the same conclusions. Uh, uh, paragraph, uh, sorry, uh, conditions 11 and 12 are now not required as a report has been submitted to address these requirements. And public protection have agreed these findings and therefore there's no requirement to, to reimpose these. Uh, furthermore, uh, sweat pass analysis plans have been provided for highways um, and they've confirmed that these are now acceptable and therefore the comment in their response that relate to sweat, sweat pass has now been addressed. Uh, and um, in terms of condition 27, the approved plans condition, that now is to be, need to be amended to, to reflect the, the, the changes. I remember further, just one, one additional condition is, is, is suggested, um, and that's with regard to the phasing of development coming forward. Um, as such, it, the additional condition is, is, is suggested to state that no more than 60 dwellings shall be occupied until the access point from Cemetery Lane and, connect, and connection to plot delivery B, uh, sorry, plot, delivery point plot A, apologies, are both constructed in accordance with the details hereby approved. So what that condition is looking to do is secure that highway connection to Cemetery Lane at an early stage, and again, at, 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 um, at 60 dwellings. And, and that, the reason for that condition is to mitigate the impacts of traffic for the development. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Chatfield. We have two speakers who wish to speak on this application. Firstly, a Mr Rowley, Rowley, who is the objector, who is with us in the chamber today. Mr Rowley, you will have five minutes, and Mr Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains. Your time starts when you start speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, on the 17th of May 2018, I addressed this committee in objection to the development of 165 dwellings to build north of Long Lane Driffield. That application was sadly approved, but in your wisdom, you applied a clause 18 on the development relating to breaching of the public footpath that was planned. This was because four houses were planned in DRFB section of the master plan and the crossing needed to, in your words, prevent through vehicular access other than emergency vehicles, cyclists and pedestrians. Similarly, on the 27th of June 2018, an email from Owen Robinson to Susan Hunt, both of East Yorkshire uh, Planning Department, stated of the revised master plan that, inverted commas, the position of the new roundabout has been moved further east and no longer cuts across Long Lane, and, inverted commas, only one crossing of Long Lane is shown, which would allow access for pedestrians and emergency vehicles only. Long Lane itself has become a motorway for construction wagons, construction workers, suppliers, contractors, and general traffic. This area originally had 83 properties. It now has approaching to 250, an increase of 200%. That's just in residence alone, much more in the aforementioned construction. A further 200 houses on DRFB could see that percentage go up to 475%. An increase of 475% in traffic on a narrow lane with hardly enough room for vehicles to pass in a residential setting. This is excessive to say the least. Long Lane has degraded over the past four years with the utility companies regularly digging it up on its full length and construction vehicles destroying the surface, curbs and footpaths. It was never designed for that amount of traffic. Furthermore, its residents have suffered from four years of constant barrage of noise, pollution, dirt, dust that is akin to a biblical plague on our lives. I would like to give some examples and issues that we've experienced over the past years. 
four years, but it's best to say that it would be very doubtful that the builders or the contractors have acted particularly well and with complete contempt to residents over the four years. At no point at the meeting four years ago, or in the period to now, has anyone challenged the fact that building will occur on the land north of Driffield, as detailed in the master plan. Our concerns have been played out in several encounters over that period. Is now construction needed to be carried out to minimise disruption of the lives and the people who live in this area? Green lanes, public bridleways and open spaces are more important now than they've ever been. During lockdown, the number of people using long lane public bridleway increased unbelievably. Runners, cyclists, dog walkers, horse riders and general walkers flooded to these spaces to find sense and solace and peace in a world that was in turmoil. And that world is still in turmoil. We're not out of the woods with COVID or a potential variant. We've cost a living crisis, which will see people needing more places like this. We have a war in Europe. Compromise and patience is what's needed at the moment to rush into allowing yet further development with unclear timelines and vague promises, along with the lifting of the clause that was in place to protect access is not the correct route of action. You, the council put clause 18 in place it's not the developer's right to have it lifted. It's the resident's right to have it kept in place, an alternative decision made to access DRFB. That decision, as it was in 2018, is to construct a roundabout off the 614, but strangely, and with great disappointment, any discussion about that has gained no traction. Homes England now have the ownership of the land where the roundabout can be constructed. Peter Moore, the tenant farmer on that land has relinquished his tenancy, making the land available going forward. So with some patience by council and developers, this could be implemented and give comfort needed to those who have had more years, more than four years of suffering. So I plead to all the councillors on the planning committee not to approve or defer this application, but to flatly reject it. I further propose that East Riding Yorkshire Council, Barrett David Wilson Homes and Homes England put all efforts into making the construction of the roundabout the immediate priority to take all these de developments in the north side of Driffield forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Uh, second, we have Mr. Natkus, the agent, who also joins in the chamber. Mr. Natkus, you too will have five minutes. And Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Apologies. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, as members are aware, this is a, a, an allocated site within the local plan. It's been voted through previously for homes and it's been to an independent inspector. And what we're looking at now is delivering those homes and the benefits that come with it. It's part of a larger allocation. However, whilst it's only 200 homes, it does deliver open space, playing fields, some sports facilities, and also contributes significantly financially to future infrastructure needs and highways development that can enable the later phases to come forward, which are outside of our control at the moment. In that respect, phase one was approved a number of years ago for 165 homes. And yes, it did have a condition on it limiting access to the south from Long Lane to only five properties. Um, however, that condition was solely put on because no work had been done at the time to assess whether Long Lane could accommodate any more homes. It wasn't considered and rejected. It just simply wasn't looked at because we didn't need it. And the hope was that when we got to this point, the roundabout would be in place and that could be used for the main access. Unfortunately, it's not. Again, it's out of our control, as you've heard, but Homes England are moving it forward and hopefully it will come forward as quickly as possible. Phase one's entering its final stages. It'll be finished early next year. And we need to look at moving on to the later phases and starting to deliver the homes. We've got a scheme in front of you that you will see has been to public consultation. It's only received three objection letters, which is, well, almost none for a scheme of this size is, is almost unheard of. It's an excellent design. It's very well thought through, a good mix of homes. And I say it also delivers other parts of that strategic allocation, not just homes. We've worked really well with highways in order to get to this point, and hopefully you can see the benefits of it. There's clearly a contentious issue, however, about highways, and that's just what I want to touch upon now. You as members haven't seen this application before. However, as pointed out, you did consider an application to vary the consent to the north and that condition, and you raised concerns about it. So rather than press ahead, go to appeal, consider alternatives, we've looked at an alternative solution to this site. And that alternative solution comes in the form of Cemetery Lane, the access to the south that officers have talked about. So as part of the scheme now, there are effectively three access points that can come forward. Cemetery Lane to the south, the roundabout to the east, and further homes coming off Long Lane to the north. 
The work that we've had done as part of this application submitted in February demonstrates that the whole of the site could be accessed from Cemetery Lane in a suitable, safe and uh, acceptable manner. However, we've been working with officers and with the highways department, looking at a holistic approach to the site and looking at something that highways believe is a more balanced, uh, a more balanced scheme. And as a consequence of those discussions, highways believe that actually allowing some further homes to come over the bridleway wouldn't harm the bridleway, wouldn't have an adverse impact on um, on highway safety, would, would actually provide a much better solution than everything coming off Cemetery Lane. Now, ultimately, the roundabout will be coming forward, hopefully sooner rather than later. And as soon as that comes forward, a huge amount of the homes from here will naturally go to the east anyway. So what we have at the moment is effectively a, a, a short term solution to deliver the much needed homes and bring forward infrastructure to help deliver the, the later phases of this, and make financial contributions to some of those roundabouts. But ultimately, we want to be able to move on to phase two and start to deliver and deliver on those homes that the council have allocated. So we think we've got a good solution to do that. It significantly reduces the number of homes from Long Lane that we previously proposed through the Section 73 application. It's opening up Cemetery Lane, which is in the council's SPD and an accepted um, route. And then it makes provision for the roundabout to come online and makes financial contributions in order to assist with those. So on balance, we think it's a really good scheme. The highways have worked with us and they believe that this is a suitable option. Officers do. And we hope that you as members can see this is a, a sensible balanced solution to enable us to deliver the homes that are needed. As I said, we've done public consultation. We've got no technical issues, as you can see from the officer's report. There's no matters in terms of ecology, landscape, open space. We comply with those requirements. We've worked well with the officers to get a layout that's varied throughout this um, in order to, to achieve a solution that they think is sensible and excellent. And we're opening up later facilities. So there's a whole host of benefits that can come with this. And we make sure that we do fully comply with the council's policies in the SPD. So we've listened to your concerns, we've worked with officers, and we hope that you can support this and enable these homes to come forward. Thank you. Thank you. That's all our speakers on this item. So I'll now open it up to members and the debates. Do any members wish to speak on this application? Councillor Davison. Just to clarify, if, if we agree this particular application, does that mean that the next application uh, falls by the wayside? Because we're talking on this one about having three accesses or two at the moment. Mr. Chatfield, can you answer that? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Chair. No, no, the answer to that is it's quite simple. No, it doesn't. Um, we've got a scheme before you at the moment which shows connectivity to the north and to the south and, and, and to, to the east there as well. The, the second application, which you're not wanted to prejudge that, but the second application, deals with a condition to block off the access to the north onto Long Lane. So, so if the so members could approve this application, but that condition, but and then consider the whether that's to be blocked off under the next application. So, so that this, this application doesn't necessarily mean that the second one falls away. It's, there's still two applications to be considered. So, so this, this application could be considered and, and along with the next application. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Um, um, I've got two or three concerns about this 200 homes. Um, first one is the density of the homes. Um, 43 per hectare seems to be enormously out of sync with what's going on around the county. Um, and, you know, 43 is what is built. I know there's a playing field and all that sort of thing, but 43 houses. Um, is, is really out of character with um, some of the other new developments, I would have said. Perhaps you can comment on that in due course. Um, you mentioned something about equipped play space, or did you? Um, and um, there isn't any, apparently. Um, and this is supposed to be in the next field or the one behind or one. Why is there no equipped play space um, as would be required on a normal um, development of 200 houses. Um, and the third question is, um, well, yeah, the two and a half um, is um, 200 houses, sorry, 198 houses and two bungalows. And quite frankly, I think that's a disgrace and uh, um, it, it just, I believe Driffield does need as many bungalows as anywhere else. And uh, to build two bungalows out of 200 
is, is um, derisory, I think. Um, also, I'm just wondering about the access. Once the access is achieved to the roundabout, does that um, invite anybody to close off one of the existing, um, whether to Long Lane or to Northfield? Um, and in talking about Northfield, I would say that there haven't been any objections from Northfield because they probably don't know about the fact that there's going to be another 200 um, residents coming down their street. Um, dare I say, because they didn't get individual letters through their letterbox, but that's another story. Um, but it really, um, to me, it's, it's over intense um, um, development is this. Um, I just wondered if you've got any comments. Yeah. Mr. Chappell, can you answer those three or four questions? Uh, certainly, yeah, the, the three each. Yeah, the, the, thank you. Um, yeah, just picking up those, those those comments individually. In terms of the density, yep, yeah, uh, the, the density figure is, is presented is that does on the face of it appear to be high, but actually what that does is that takes out most of the play space and the open green space within the site. If you include everything, it brings it down to about 20, 20 dwellings per hectare. Um, so it, in, in terms of, sort of finding middle ground between those, you're looking at roughly about 35 dwellings per hectare, which is, which is about normal. Um, in terms of the play space, it, it, in terms of my update, I did, I did mention the fact that um, amended plans have been included, which do include open um, children's play space. If you can just look at the plan in front of you, you can just see where those two, so almost looks like inverted threes are that sort of, thank you, Tom, just in there. Um, that's, the, the, that's where the children's play space is going to be. Well, what, what they've actually done, there's a slightly older plan, but they've, the, the, where those three trees are in the middle, that's actually now going to be children's play space in that area there. So, so children's play space provided centrally located location uh, and with um, overlooked by houses as well in, in, a, in, a, in a good location within there. Um, in terms of the bungalow issue, again, yep, two bungalows per, per 200 dwellings is, it, yeah, it's, it's a low figure, but I think it has to be looked at within the overall mix of what's being proposed here. In terms of, it's a, it's a, it's a, as officers feel, it's a good mix of dwellings, a very large proportion of three bedroom dwellings and, and some, some quite smaller three bedroom dwellings and, and larger two bedroom dwellings in there. And I think it's, it's reaching that balance. And I think that that's what the policy always looks to do is reach a balance on this. Um, and, and, really to come forward, but we, we feel that balance has, has been reached and, and, and is acceptable in relation to this. But again, in terms of the development coming forward, this is part, roughly um, about a third of the larger development, which is going to come forward on the, on the remaining allocation as well, which would be, be developed. So, so this isn't the, the whole scheme in its entirety. There is space for, on that site for, for alternative provisions of, of you know, slightly different housing to be provided on this one. But in terms of what's been provided here, we feel it's, it's, it's reasonable density taking in what's gone on board. And actually it's not out of keeping when you can see from the plans in front of you in terms of the, the surrounding location, in terms of the housing mix, which is there. We feel it's a very good layout in terms of design of what's been well landscaped. Um, and so on, on that basis, we're, we're happy with it. In terms of the access from, um, from the roundabout, there are no plans to, to close off um, the, the existing roads once the roundabout's in place. Um, obviously, we don't know when the roundabout's going to be in place, but now we do know that Homes England are involved. We do, now the councils are the government's arm in delivering housing. We know that they're involved. Um, and with their involvement, it, you know, the, 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 it's the much greater certainty that that roundabout will now happen. And in, in terms of closing off, it probably wouldn't be necessary because the roundabout and that route out to the east would be the main route out. Um, and as clearly set out in the report, this wouldn't result in any rat running running through, through the site because of the geometry and the way it's set out around perimeter blocks with the traffic calming measures, the raised tables in there. So it just wouldn't be used as a rat run. So there's no need to close off either of those two accesses once, once the roundabout's in place. Thank you, Chair. Any more comments, Councillor Davison? Just to say that that would allow um, traffic to come from the next site, which is nearer the roundabout, for instance, dropping their kids off at the primary school, which is down Northfield or Cemetery Lane. So that's going, to, that's going to generate more traffic and also the established use that has already been established by those people who are living in those properties because they've got used to going down Northfield. So um, I think there ought to be some remedy for that, um, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I, I wasn't able to make the site visit, and obviously I would be 
pleased to have done so, but I just wasn't able to make uh, the site visits that we had that, uh, that morning. However, um, I think there's a lot of positives to this application. Um, certainly, first of all, as, uh, as, the, as, as the agent has already said, um, it is an allocated site, so there's no doubt about it. It, it is for housing. Um, I also take uh, comfort in the fact that uh, there's been there's actually eight uh, parts of the uh, Section 106 agreement, uh, and I'm particularly concerned, or not concerned, but happy to see uh, item seven uh, regarding a contribution to the roundabout, which can only move things forward uh, for that part of Driffield, and of course for this site. And we're going to end up here with this site eventually with three accesses, which, which is fine. It is part of a, a larger development. We, we've got the um, oncoming uh, development site uh, 150, which is part of the allocation of, the, of this in this area. Um, so there's a lot of positives and there's a lot going to be, uh, what, over a million pounds, in fact, uh, within over a million pounds within the 106 agreement, which can only benefit the local people, play space, outdoor play area, so on, um, and um, and plenty of uh, to say that they're, they're going to uh, contribute also to education and so on. So there's there's a lot of benefits to this site, and uh, looking at uh, re reading the report, studying the report, um, I do not see any great problems with this, and I quite happily uh, move the deferral. Uh, the the uh, the recommendation to defer for to sign the 106 agreement, and it it does it does help very much so in the sense that you know there is going to be a contribution towards this uh, roundabout access to the roundabout and so on, which of course can benefit many many people in the area. So quite happy to move the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Road, Councillor Meredith. Thank you very much, Chair. A uh, few things to say on this. Uh, I'll start by expressing some sympathy for Mr. Rowley and the, uh, the traffic impact that he did mention. However, I do feel obligated to point out that we can really only consider the end result of any uh, planning application. Truth be told, if we could object to the building process, we would all still be living in caves. And as a result, it was Councillor Davison's comments about the extra vehicles post-development that were my primary concern when looking at this, alongside um, a trifecta of factors that are not ideal individually and combined lead me to, I sorry, apologies, Mr. Chatfield, um, have to disagree with your conclusion about the balance being found. So firstly, we have an increase in 35 houses from the 2018 application before us today. Secondly, we have a reduction in the affordable housing to 10% low, below what the council would like to see. And thirdly, we have three to four times more four bedroom houses than the council's policy would again like to see pre uh, presented in an application. Now, you add to that, as again, Councillor Davison pointed out, that it's potentially up to 40% higher than the average of 30 houses per hectare that, that policy suggests is appropriate. In what is a rural area, let's be honest, you know, we're not talking about Leeds, Manchester here, we're talking about towns and villages in the East Riding. There's not a single city in our county. So 35 as a maximum is still at the high end of the spectrum. And quite frankly, saying that people can be sardines here because there's space there is, in my opinion, a step too far, I'm afraid. Uh, Add to that Councillor Davison's comments about uh, the lack of bungalows, and I think we might even have cracked upon a solution there. Um, bungalows are very land hungry, which in turn would lower the density, would provide more of the appropriate housing that an area with a 5% more pensionable population than the national average would benefit from. So I would like to, uh, apologies to Councillor Rudd here, I would like to uh, put forward my own proposal, and that is that we do defer and delegate but with the officers requested to require more bungalows on the site and lower density. And that if that can't be achieved, then they uh, do not have the, the ability to, uh, to approve under the delegation that we've uh, allowed them. Uh, the reason I say that is because Councillor Rudd's comments about the Section 106 agreement and the contributions to the area are accurate and do illustrate positive aspects. There are benefits to this application. It is, it is an allocated site those two factors can't be avoided. 
I'm just not entirely satisfied with what I see before us. I think officers can resolve it, so I'm still happy to uh, go along with the defer and delegate, but I would like to see further negotiations take place rather than exactly what we see before us today being approved. Thank you, Chair. I would accept that, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. So, Councillor Rudd, you're happy to accept the additions to your amendment from Councillor yeah. Meredith, so in which case, Councillor Meredith, are you happy to be Councillor Rudd's seconder? I am indeed. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Thank you. I have Councillor Whittle next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Meredith, in his inimitable way, has poached all the comments I was going to make, so I should be even briefer than I normally am. Uh, I, too, am very concerned about housing mix. I find it inconceivable that we have a, a whole housing strategy and development team that indicates what sort of mix there should be on a site such as this. And then um, it's accepted later in the document uh, through some jiggery pokery saying that three bedroom pounds, pound homes look very much like two bedroom homes and therefore it's all all right. I don't think it is all right, Chair. Uh, when we look at five to 10% of new dwellings should have one bedroom, on this development there's one percent. And if you look at the, 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 the four bedroom houses, 10 to 15%, uh, in actual fact, it's 40%. So I'm entirely in agreement with Councillors Meredith uh, and Red on, on this. Um, my, my other concerns usually, as usual, are um, regarding the design, which um, well, the housing design does indeed reflect what one may expect to find in suburban Driffield. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's pretty, particularly good. Uh, I'm not hugely impressed. But there again, sadly, Chair, I rarely am hugely impressed with housing development and design. Uh, and my last query is, um, I, I may have missed it in the numerous updates we, we've received, but we keep hearing about this fabled roundabout, the roundabout which will uh, uh, answer all our dreams and prayers for the, the future. Uh, exactly how far away is this roundabout in time? Uh, is it going to be next year, 10 years, 20 years? Do we have any indication whatsoever of when this fabled roundabout is, is to be built. Now, when it is built, are we going to have fanfares and drums and uh, trumpets just to salute the fact it's actually being constructed? Thank you, Councillor So Could the officers ask, answer that question about the roundabout, please? Uh, as best I can, Chair, yeah. Um, it, we, clearly, we don't, have, we, we don't have a definite date for the roundabout, but it, it, is, it is imminent. It is coming much sooner. It's definitely not 10 years away. It's, it's much closer than that. Um, th I think the reason what members can have uh, comfort in that is Homes England's um, involvement now. It's not, it's not up to a private developer to bring this forward. It's essentially it's the government's housing arm which is bringing this forward now. Uh, this scheme does provide, you know, as I said in my update, a hefty contribution to, um, to highways, nearly, nearly you know, 669,000 to the, to, the to, the, to the roundabout on the 614 alone. So, so this scheme makes a substantial contribution to, that, to bring that, that roundabout forward. So actually, in, in, in some respects, this, assist, this scheme will assist in, in that, that roundabout coming forward. But I think with Homes England's involvement in it now, um, it's, and, it's, and I think Homes England have now gone public at the consultation events on that. And I think with that, that knowledge and with that public announcement, I think members can be reasonably secure that that, that roundabout will happen. Thank you. I have Councillor Healy wishing to speak next. Yeah, it was just a, a couple of uh, questions as well as comment. Um, so when, when Mr. Rowley spoke, um, and it's, I think it's about the relationship between these the two applications, number five and number six, because Mr. Rowley was, was speaking very much about the access and about the bridle path and, and mentioned the 2018, 165 dwellings and condition 18. Now, obviously, and he made the point probably correctly that this committee, presumably then, imposed condition 18 for a good reason. But he was talking more about application six than application five. So I just wanted to understand the implications of this. So if, for example, item six, which we've not discussed yet, is refused, what's the implication for item five for the, the development? I think it's important that we that we that we understand what that because what that means. Um, so maybe you could answer that, and I'll just make the other comments after that then. Yeah, Mr. Chatfield, can you answer that question? Yeah, no, please? absolutely. Again, again, to three, Chair. Um, Councillor, yeah, in terms of, I mean, the, the plan up in front of you, it's essentially the, the condition six, which they were not preempting the discussions on that application, but that requires that bollards to be provided to effectively block off long lane to vehicular traffic. Still leaves um, pedestrian, cyclist traffic, but um, vehicular traffic. So the effects of, of that would be this scheme proposes two access roads, well, actually three, um, if you 
with the main access being out east when that scheme comes forward. Essentially, you've got three vehicular access points being provided here. So, so the, the effect of, of that, if, if Long Lane were to be blocked up, it means that in a, in a, you'd have one access point from Cemetery Lane okay. for, for this development until they, the connection to the east is provided. Okay, so you've got a plan B, which is basically one less access point to the, to the estate. Right, okay, thank you. Um, and, and on the point about bungalows, yes, I think that Councillor Meredith hit it on the head. He picked up on Councillor Davidson's comments about, about bungalows. Uh, this is the East Riding. I mean, a personal experience of elderly parents and trying to move across from Lancashire to the East Riding. And in, in fact, Driffield was one of the places that they looked at. Can you find a bungalow in Driffield? It's very, very difficult, actually. Old people really can't manage stairs. Um, and people in their sort of advanced ages, 80 plus. Um, I think two bungalows is a bit of a nonsense, really. Um, I think also the point about density was discussed as well. Let, let's have a look at that again. Let's have a look at the density. I mean, if you're making bungalows, then presumably, you know, you can make, you can reduce density um, because they're smaller. Um, so that, those are the points I would like to make. I, I, would, I, would, I would concur with, with uh, the proposal that's been put forward by Councillor Meredith about the, uh, uh, and relook at this in terms of density. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do any of the members wish to speak this application? Councillor Meredith, if you wish to come back in, how oh, am I not surprised? There was one more question I had, Chair, and uh, I didn't want to disappoint you, um, but I didn't want to distract from the main issues of the discussion, so I did want to save it to the end. And the picture on the screen there perfectly illustrates it. There are three brick set areas, it would appear. Now, from my own personal experience with ward work, they actually create something of an issue for road sweepers because they rip the cement out, and as such, it keep, keep, makes it very hard to clean. And I was just wondering wondering if this is something that could be looked into as part of the deferral discussions to say that could that be either mitigated against or addressed in some such way, whether it's entirely tarmac, concreted, uh, just through my own personal experience, I have an aversion to brick set paving because it is very difficult to make sure it's kept properly clean without actually causing damage to the highway. Can the highways officer advise on that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, these brick set, um, raised tables and or um, cul-de-sacs, if you like. Um, usually less than 50 40 dwellings. This is something, a standard practice we'd allow um, with service strips and service margins. Um, there is some slight tweaks required to the plan that you see in front of us, obviously to be deferred to the highways officer. Um, it, it's in our local plan. We use it quite regularly. Um, in terms of road sweepers, the few and far between, um, there's not really much more concern on that other than they are acceptable and they do comply with the des highway design guide. Oh, thank you, Chair. I, I just thought it would be remiss of me not to mention it, having tried to cross that bridge before. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Any other members wish to speak on this application? No. Well, just from me, I mean, obviously, first of all, this is an allocated site, so it will be developed. But that doesn't mean we need to do all we can to make sure it is right for the local area and the local residents who already live there. I agree with a lot of what committee members have said. There's a couple of points which I've picked up in the report, which I wouldn't mind officers answering or addressing. Firstly, is the ecological side of things. So I noticed in the report, we obviously have a condition asking that there would be no loss of biodiversity uh, as part of this development. But I also noticed in the report, there's no comments from our ecological conservation team or from natural England. So how do we know what the current biodiversity level on site is to ensure we don't lose it? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and the, the report's been some, um, accompanied by a preliminary ecological uh, assessment which, which sets out the, you know, the, the basic parameters. Uh, in terms of that condition, which, which is a relatively standard condition we do impose on, on planning applications, requires ecological enhancement. So um, that condition would be, would be with discharge in conjunction with and, and consultation with, with our biodiversity. Natural England's not invo involvement in this is, is, is not unusual because it's, it's not near any statutory um, or protected area where natural England would be involved. So the, the natural England ordinarily wouldn't be involved in a scheme like this, but it's certainly in discharge of that condition to ensure that we do get a, as much um, um, ecological enhancement as we can, we would, we would discuss that and would agree that with our, with our colleagues in biodiversity team. Thank you, that's good to know. And obviously that'll be included as part of the wildlife enhancement plan. Anything from that assessment 
Uh, my other concern is around housing mix, as other members have raised. Two points here. Firstly, the bungalow situation that Councillor Davis and Councillor Meredith and others have raised. It is a bit concerning that 200 houses were getting only two bungalows, especially when I was under the impression that this allocation has a some form of condition on it which requires care living. Um, is that correct? It, it does. It requires a provision of extra care, but that's, that, that's some provision within the whole allocation. And, and the whole allocation is, is a substantially larger base than, than this one. So, so the, the, the fact that it's not being provided on this relatively small, but probably about a third quarter of the site, it, it, it doesn't mean it can't be provided. And again, it's sort of thing that potentially could be provided with Homes England involvement on the, on, on the second phase. Okay. And then also on housing mix, I have a concern, as Councillor Whittle raised, about the 40% four bedroom houses when we normally ask for, I believe, 10 to 15%. Obviously, that's, that is considerably more than what we normally ask for. I know, obviously, this developer is providing a lot as well on the sides of it, but it's still considerably over the amount that we normally ask for, plus we have a drop in the amount of affordable homes we're asking for too. So I'm not particularly comfortable with that. Personally, I prefer to see more three bedroom homes, but I will obviously uh, give way to the uh, housing strategies advice on that as to whether they think we should have a, a high percentage of two beds or three beds as part of this development when, when if members are minded to defer for those reasons. And the final point I think I'd just make is that for me, obviously a big concern about this as we discussed is about access. And if it wasn't for two, two elements of this, the inclusion of the cemetery lane access and the condition to bring that forward um, at an early phase, and also the assurance that Homes England is now involved in the roundabout, I wouldn't be supporting the application because I think to put all the traffic through Long Lane would not be acceptable. So I think the inclusion of cemetery lane is, 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 is really key to this here. And obviously the involvement of Homes England, which gives us assurance rather than a private developer bringing forward the roundabout. But um, just to clarify the members, because there's been quite a few suggested reasons for deferring, deferring the application. I've got from Councillors Rudd and Meredith um, the, to, to see if we can increase the number of bungalows on site and also to see if we can lower the density of housing. Now, personally, I don't have much of an issue with the housing density, because if you drive around, as I did on the site visit, the other neighbouring estates, they are all quite high density. So my view is, is that that's not necessary. But I do agree with the bungalows, and I'd also like to include trying to get a reduction in the number of four-bedroom homes for, in my view, preferably three-bedroom homes, but whatever housing strategy I think is best for this local housing market. Is, are there, were there any other suggested deferrals from members? No? So my question to the committee would be, would you be happy to drop the housing density reason for deferral? Because I think that is not particularly relevant to this part of Driftfield from the local um, estates that are already there, plus all the other stuff we're getting as part of this development, as Councillor Wood outlined. Councillor Coltish. Well, Chairman, if you don't mind me um, suggesting, uh, the density would naturally be reduced if in negotiations uh, we could get more bungalows instead of four bedrooms and more two or three bedrooms instead of four bedrooms. That would naturally reduce the density. So we could, uh, as you say, drop the mention of reducing density in favour of increasing bungalows and two and three bedroom houses. Councillor Rudin, Meredith, are you happy with that suggestion for your motion? Would it uh, be meritorious or um, add difficulty if we were to say that the maximum amount of housing would be 190, for example, in place of 200? Uh, as I pointed out, bungalows are land hungry. Um, dormer bungalows are a very good thing because they provide visitor rooms. I'm not saying the bungalows have to be single storey, but as Councillor Healy uh, pointed out perfectly, it's that ground floor bedroom that is key. Um, so I don't know what the best way to achieve bungalows, which as you say, Chair, is the priority, um, but bungalows are land hungry. You would have to have even less affordable housing um, if the developer was to keep the 200 properties and provide more bungalows. I, I don't want to sort of do um, housing strategies job for them or tie their hands. I just know that what I see before us could and should be better. And the fact that when you combine the density, the lack of affordable housing, the lack of bungalows, the amount three to fourfold of what we would want in four bedroom housing, that to me smacks of a developer pleading poverty, which makes me chortle, but not sympathetic. I mean, my, I'll, I'll ask you, bring the officers, but my personal view on that would be that wouldn't necessarily be necessary because we're already asking for more bungalows and also for a reduction in the four bedroom homes. And I am thinking it is, though obviously we know developers aren't the poorest of, of organisations, 
they are offering over a million pounds worth of benefits to the local community. And I'd be hesitant to lose that because I think that is one of the big uh, benefits of this allocation for Driftfield. So, but I will ask Mr. Chatfield if he could advise in terms of can members request that if they wish. Um, in terms of numbers, the, the schemes we, we can't go back and ask for the scheme to be have to consider the schemes before us in terms of in terms of numbers. We, we can't we can't say well we'll approve a scheme for 190 or 150. It, the scheme here for 200, and that, that that's members need to consider. Um, in, in terms of bungalows, a couple of issues, and it's an issue we're always grappling with in terms of two, you know on the one hand we say not enough two story, not enough two bedroom, three bedroom dwellings, and too many four bed. On but on the plus side, the density is too 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 high. And I think they're, unfortunately, they are not good bedfellows. The, the, eventually, the more two-bedroom two than two, three-bedroom properties you put on, the higher the density goes, the more four-bedrooms, the lower the density goes. Also, the other thing to bear in mind on this one is in terms of viability. Um, I understand the point we've made in terms of viability assessment, but it's been robustly assessed by our independent, our own viability, by estates and valuation officers. And, that's, that, and they look at it very, very carefully. The, the advice they're giving to, to us and to members is that as it stands at the moment with those substantial contributions which are being made in excess of one million pound as it was mentioned earlier though this this scheme is viable with only 15 percent coming forward and that's on the mix which has been provided in this so if, if that mix is is, up, is upturned then potentially that would have an impact upon viability but that's something that members also should be aware of um in terms of the, the overall mix as well something that's mentioned in the report but i really feel it's probably worthwhile mentioning again that Again, we don't live in an age where four bedrooms are four bedrooms detached and three bedrooms at smaller dwellings. There's a mix. And in terms of the mix which has been provided here, we're looking at a cross section. Some of the four beds are actually smaller than some of the three beds. So in terms of having that wider mix of housing, which is, and ultimately that's the most important thing of what the policy is trying to achieve. It's trying to achieve a mixture of housing. So it appeals to a range for everyone there. Um, and it's certainly in terms of what we're looking at here is that there's that mixture within the three beds, within that to provide that, provide that size so the size quite you know, some big bigger properties and also some smaller properties, but the bedrooms don't necessarily coincide with what's bigger and what's smaller. Um, and again, in terms of the bungalows, in terms of the bungalow issue, the, the point we we're looking for is houses which are designed really for um, sort of lifetime use. So you, you can you can arrive, you can live in the same house all the way through your lifetime, and it's that adaptability which is the most important thing. So if there's if you can have um, ground floor wash facilities. And, and doors which are wide enough for, for push chairs or wheelchairs that's coming through as the growing age and needs a population, then again, that's something we'd look at. So but another course for members really to, rather than necessarily bungalows per se, is to ensure that the houses are provided with sufficient uh, ground floor accommodation that will, that will allow that to be that adaptability within there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McMaster, you wish to come in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I thought I had a solution, but um, uh, Mr. Chatfield's elegant explanation kind of counter counters what I was about to say. I was about to say, let's keep the numbers the same. Let's factor in the developers investing heavily in the community. Let's keep the numbers the same. Sacrifice a couple of three bedrooms for bungalows, perhaps one or two more four bedrooms for an extra number of perhaps two bedrooms. So we end up with the same number of dwellings in the area, just a slightly different mix. Um, I don't know if that's anything that could be considered, but um, Mr. Chatfield's explanation kind of counters that. So I'll leave that open on the table for debate. Thank you, Councilman Master. I mean, obviously it's up to committee members, but my my view is that we defer, which is obviously it's recommended for deferral anyway. Um, I, don't, I don't think the um, housing density situation is something that is of the utmost importance because I do, from going to the site, neighboring prop the neighboring estates are also of high density i think what is more of a priority is trying to get more ground floor accommodation we should say rather than bungalows as such because that is key for our east riding aging population so my view would be in line with um councillor rudds and councillor meredith's uh motion for deferral is to remove the density part and just ask for the additional request that officers go back and try and negotiate additional first floor accommodation on site Sorry, is that Councillor? Uh, sorry, Mr. Chap, you were just. So, 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 sorry, Chair, we've got additional ground floor accommodation. Chair, yeah. sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor Healy? Yeah, I think that is the important point that this is about ground floor living space. Now, I don't know how you define a bungalow, but my definition is, of, is there's no stairs. Um, so, if you want to call it a bungalow or you want to call it ground floor house with, with, with you know, called ground floor living, 
But, but I, I also take a bit of issue, I'll challenge you on, on the point about providing accommodation for a whole lifetime. There are people who move into the East Riding at a later stage of life and who are looking for an end of life home. Um, and East Riding is attractive for, for many people for that reason. We have people moving to coastal communities from West Yorkshire and we have people moving to Driffield and Beverly um, later on in life. So I think that, that it, it is an important point about this single story accommodation. I, I think, Chair, you probably, the solution is perhaps the correct one, but um, if we focus on that single story accommodation uh, and that officers come back with, uh, with a suitable solution for that. Thank you. So Councillor Rudd and Councillor Meredith has the proposal and seconder. Are you happy that we are now your motion is now to defer in line with the recommendation of the report, but also request that officers negotiate further to include more ground floor living accommodation. I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. And Councillor Meredith? Yeah. Okay. We have a motion, I believe, Mr. Wan. Chairman, I just need to check an element of it. You're saying defer and delegate for further consultations. However, what happens if those negotiations are unsuccessful? Do you, are you still delegating authority to approve the application as it stands or not? No, I think we should bring it back to committee. Yeah, bring back to committee. Right, so it's deferring delegates, subject to further consultations and bring back to committee for determination. Yeah. Thank you. Right, that's the motion, everyone. So all those in favour of that proposal, it's unanimous. And everyone keep their hands up. Two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, Chairman. That is therefore carried and back over to officers for further negotiations. Uh, we then move on to agenda item number six, which is the removal of condition 18 of the neighbouring development of the previous one we've just discussed. Can I have the officers update, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, the, the, you'll be pleased to know a much shorter update to this one. Um, this application, is, as mentioned previously, was deferred from January Committee to enable it to be considered at the same time as the, the major application for the Phase 2 development. Um, and that Phase 2, consider, it's the one you just, just approved, or just considered previously. Um, and and as, as proved on that previous application, that will be accessed by three, three access points from the south, from the north, and from the east. Um, and that search because of those three access points, the potential level of traffic using Long Lane or actually crossing Long Lane would be substantially reduced from, from when we was first considered. I think the most important point there is to consider that the condition, reason for the condition was put on is because that phase two application wasn't in the system and we had we didn't know what was, what was being provided. And more importantly, there was no transport assessment to, to, to robustly assess that, which is why we took a precautionary approach with that condition. Um, with, this, with this scheme, but because of those, um, because of those there's additional access points which have been provided. Highway officers are recommending approval of this scheme, um, essentially pub because of that reducing the flows and reducing the traffic that's actually going to cross Long Lane. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chatfield. We have three speakers on this application. Firstly, Mr. Rowley, the objector. Mr. Rowley, again, you'll have five minutes to make your points known to the committee, and Mr. Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains. Time starts when you start speaking. Thank you. I have a speech here which very much mirrored the previous one because the two development proposals are very much interlinked and one or two of your councillors have kindly highlighted that so I'm going to wing this one a little bit. The clause 18 was to prevent vehicular access apart from emergency and cyclists. We knew that the DRFB was going to come up so it wasn't anything that wasn't expected. That's why the clause was put in. It wasn't put in to then say, well, when they apply to build houses there, we'll lift the clause. Because the point was to maintain the integrity of a public bridleway, which is Long Lane. Not to then decide at a later point whether we want to cross it or not to fit in with developers' plans. That's the crux of this. Because the developments around the Long Lane public bridleway have been discussed on many occasions. Yeah, yes, they will happen. Four years ago, nearly to the date, we accepted they were gonna happen. The development isn't the problem. We understand that it's in the, the master plan. It's how that development is accessed. And I've heard two or three times today about people saying, 
it's accessed by three routes. It's not. Currently, it's accessed by one. Your intent on doing exactly the same as you've done to Long Lane down Cemetery Lane, which is probably even a narrower access than Long Lane was, and the access point into this development area is exactly the same point where there's a junior school. Now, if the access is put in process in the same way as they did down Long Lane, boys, there's going to be some troubles down there. Really, really significant issues for people that are living down there, people that are taking the children to school, people that are going to the cemetery, people that are going to the allotments, people that are using the sports ground. I think I'm, I'm and I don't wish to be clever on this, I think I'm the only person in this chamber who actually lives there and has experienced this throughout the past four years. So please take it upon my knowledge of that, exactly what we've been dealing with for four years. It's not an issue about the planning, it's about the issue about the access. Currently, there's one access. They're suggesting that they put another access in, which is equally absurd as to the Long Lane one when they did it four years ago. So the, the crux of the matter is, as I previously said, about putting that third access in, which is the major one of the A614, which is a roundabout. And the councillor there said, the councillor Whittle, about, about you know, the panacea of this this third access, this roundabout, it was a valuable and, and really important thing said four years ago. Now in four years, we've built 165 houses. We've put another planning application in. We've put a, 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 a lift into the clause 18. There's been thousands of houses built throughout the whole of East Ryde, New Yorkshire, but we've not managed to move one inch on a roundabout. And that's where the efforts need to be put in. Now Cortez burned his ships when he got to the continent to motivate his men. My suggestion is let's reject these applications and therefore that will create the kind of environment that there'll be enough traction from East Riding Council, from Homes England and from the developers to make sure they deliver on this roundabout and lift this problem that will be around this area all the time. Because bearing in mind, after this one's built, there's another piece of land that, that a farmer owns at the back of the original 165 homes that they'll be putting an application in to build on that. And I bet bottom dollar again, they'll be turning around and saying, forget the roundabout, let it go up long lane. And I'll predict that now. And we'll be there in four years time again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. And then the second speaker again is Mr. Nakus. Mr. Nakus, you have five minutes as well. And Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remain. Your time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. I shouldn't get anywhere near five minutes and appreciate you've got a lot of speakers, so I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, I think the, the first point I just want to raise for members is that this application isn't considering Cemetery Lane. It's, it's not considering the merits of Cemetery Lane. It's not considering the suitability of that access. Ultimately, the previous application for the 200 homes included the Cemetery Lane access what this application is seeking to do is to incorporate a potential third access which is the use of the long lane access and the crossing of the bridleway so as the the previous application was considered um, and the deferral for us to look at the layouts i i think from that deferral that it was considered cemetery lane and the roundabout would be acceptable so what we're focused on here is that it, effectively lifting the condition at the moment that's there means that when this scheme gets built, there will be the opportunity for three different access points. If you were to refuse this application and not allow the variation of that condition, then it means that any future application would come from Cemetery Lane and from the roundabout as per when that comes back with a, an amended layout. So in terms of the long lane use and the bridleway, um, I wasn't involved in that scheme, quite happy to say it. I wasn't involved in the history and the discussions. However, I have read the reports and the documents that went with it. And I just draw members attention to paragraph 7.2 of the report, just so that you can see this in writing rather than me just asking you to take my word for it, which is where it gives the condition and the wording of that. And it ident identifies on the last paragraph of that, that this condition is imposed to secure a suitably designed and located highway feature to prevent vehicular access to, um, to this portion of the housing from the wider allocation to prevent an increase in traffic along Long Lane or linked to the wider highway network, which has not been previously part of any transport assessment, as well as minimising on the bridleway. Now, we never, ever considered 
further homes off Long Lane. The transport assessment that came in for the 163 homes only considered 163 homes. It stopped at that point because we all hoped the roundabout would be in and it would come forward. If the transport assessment at that point had have come in for 363 homes, but the conclusion was only 163 can come off there, it would have been considered, it would have been assessed and we wouldn't be here even discussing this because it had clearly been done. It didn't. The transport assessment only considered 163 homes. So what we've done as part of this application is to consider the further number of homes. And what that transport assessment confirms is that once that work has been done, it is acceptable. And the highways officers have confirmed that from a highway safety perspective, it is acceptable. And similarly in terms of crossing the bridleway. However, as things have moved on, when we last spoke on this application, which I think may have be, been June of last year, um, you were concerned about that and we understood that. So that's why the previous scheme brought forward an alternative. So even though we're asking you to lift this condition, we're not asking you to lift it as the sole condition that would have another 200 homes come off because the cemetery lane access and ultimately at some point, hopefully in the near future, Highways England are now progressing with that roundabout. The money from the scheme will go towards developing that, that you will actually have a significantly less. And once this scheme is built out and the, the access is in, I think we can all understand that anyone to the east will naturally go to the east of the roundabout. Anyone to the south will naturally travel to the south. And in reality, the number of people crossing the bridleway may be no greater than what's there at the moment. So we're not asking for all 200 over this. We're not even probably asking for 100 over this in the future. Um, cemetery Lane is that main access. However, this condition does remain. As I discussed, we could theoretically take everything off Cemetery Lane. That's what the work shows. But through discussions with highways, they prefer to have the three different accesses and allow that dissemination of traffic in, in three different ways in the future. So um, hopefully you can understand that the work has been done. This isn't just a case of a developer not liking a condition that was imposed and seeking to change it. The work was never done and it has now been done and that's how we get to this conclusion. So hopefully you can support it and it gives that future flexibility for the, the delivery of the site. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we have a local ward member, Councillor Lee. So I'm sure you know, Councillor, you two have five minutes. Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, since the original meeting to decide on this application, the committee has now had the opportunity to visit the site of Long Lane and appreciate the importance of the well-established public right-of-way, as well as reviewing the wider housing development. The right-of-way is a beautiful and well-used local amenity, which has a long history. According to a local archaeologist, Long Lane is the oldest road, known road in Driffield, coming from the original Roman road in Killam, is therefore steeped in local history. It was always anticipated that this extensive housing development would have the access from a newly constructed roundabout on the A614, and failure of all parties to bring this to a timely conclusion has resulted in the request uh, for uh, relax, or sorry, for condition 18 to be removed. It should simply not be the case that local residents should be penalised by this inaction to the detriment of the quality, their quality of life and destroying in the process a beautiful right of way, which has existed for such a long time. Agreement to approve this application today would have a devastating impact on the residents of Long Lane and adjoining roads. The issue has already caused acute anxiety and stress to local residents and could potentially add even further loss of amenity following the major disruption caused in the initial construction phase of the development. For the avoidance of any doubt, the reasons given for the imposition of uh, condition 18 in the first place was, and I quote, to provide a suitably designed loc and located highway feature to prevent an increase in traffic onto Long Lane to the wider DRFB allocation and to minimize the impacts of the bridleway. Just at the time when this condition is needed more than ever, why are the developers seeking this to have this removed? Local residents have fully acknowledged the need to create more homes in this allocated site. And these adjoining developments should be a shining example of a well-designed, well-executed plan. However, the application to relax this condition completely undermines the integrity of these developments and despite the traffic survey, local residents know it will cause acute traffic congestion and disruption onto Long Lane. Safety issues at the junction with Scarborough Road and will destroy a historic right of way used by many local people. 
I would urge the committee to pay particular note to the major concern expressed by the public's right of way and countryside access, in which they say the condition was put on to protect the viability and integrity of the bridleway. They go on to say that by removing this condition, the network would have a significant adverse effect imposed upon it and it would go against nat the national policy planning framework. Paragraph one of the NPPF states that planning policies and decisions should aim to achieve healthy and inclusive safe places which do not undermine the quality of life in the community. Paragraph 102 of the NPPF states that transport issues should be considered from the earlier stages of planning and making of, of, of development proposals. Members of the committee, this is clearly not taken place. Paragraph 104 of the NPPF states that planning policies should provide a high quality, high quality walking and cycle networks. They go on to conclude the first, sorry, the most important text is set out in paragraph 18 of the NPPF, which states planning policies and decisions should protect and enhance public rights of way and access, including taking opportunities to provide better facilities for users, for example, by adding links to the rights of way networks, including national trails. By all tests, the relaxation of condition 18 fails the community. It fails the plan uh, and fails the core council, a core council priority of valuing the environment. It also contravenes the central messages of the government's national design guide published in October 2019, particularly in the area of providing well-designed areas that are safe. I would strongly urge the committee committee members to refuse this application uh, and the application and to put in place the access road on the A614 before development of this site. The agent has, the agent has already confirmed that the building or the development can go ahead without the removal of clause 18, condition 18. Uh, this is so fundamental members, I would ask you to consider this very seriously and refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. There's no more speakers, so we'll open it up to the committee. Do any members wish to speak? Councillor Healy. Well, yeah, well, I'd like to ask some questions, really. Um, it says at 1.4, as the roundabout to the A614 hasn't been delivered yet, ac access to the site is sought through the existing development from Long Lane. Well. Why does it not say, as the roundabout to A614 has not been delivered yet, it would be a good idea to deliver this roundabout? I mean, I don't understand why we haven't got a roundabout. I'm, I've not been to this site, and I, I'm sort of a bit of a layperson in terms of thinking about it that way. But if the problem is access to the site and the solution is a roundabout, why do they have to go and build access across a much-loved amenity where, which people like and walk the dogs and go to their allotments and things? So... The question really is, what's happening with this roundabout? And can we not see a planning application for that rather than a planning application for something that's going to destroy the habitat and the countryside? Mr. Chatfield, can you answer that question? Uh, and the, thank you, Chair. No, again, again, through you. Um, yep, um, absolutely, Councillor. I mean, there's something I did mention on the, on the previous application. In terms of the delivery of the roundabout, the, the, the whole purpose of the roundabout was essentially to, to collect funds from the contributions from this development, from this residential development, which will contribute towards the, the provision of the roundabout. So in terms of the, the roundabout here, previous scheme, which members considered, £669,000 from that will go towards contribution of the roundabout. In terms of where we are at the moment, we have Homes England, the government's housing arm, in effect, they are providing the development and the, and the roundabout will be provided as part of that, that wider scheme. So, so that, that's good. that scheme is within their programme and it will be delivered as part of their thing. So. In, in terms of where we are now, obviously I can't necessarily say why it hasn't happened in the, in the past, maybe because the development maybe hasn't come forward earlier in terms of those contributions, which are which are needed, very much needed to actually ensure the delivery of, of, of that roundabout. But um, in terms of where we are, all I can confirm is Homes England are involved in the delivery of the remainder of this allocation. And with that will be, the, the roundabout will be delivered as part of that. Well, yeah, well, surely we need to build the roundabout first in, in the same way uh, as we did in Molescroft um, with the Elm Tree Park development, uh, which was built, uh, was it, well, that Northern Bypass was built from developers' uh, contributions. Um, 
and that round that access road, that bypass and those roundabouts were operational um, quite early on. Surely that's where we should be going with this and building the roundabout and refusing this until such time as the roundabout's been built. Mr. Chatfield, do you want to reply? Um, I'm not totally sure what I can say, Chair, actually. In terms of this, this scheme as well, I mean, what we're looking at it effectively is we're looking at whether the bollards are needed on this part of it to essentially to, to, um, to, to seal off and to prevent vehicle traffic crossing Long Lane. In terms of the, the roundabout, I've answered this in terms of it's going to be delivered as part of that uh, scheme. I can't necessarily provide that, that, that comparison with other schemes where roundabouts have been provided or roundabouts haven't been provided. But I think in terms of here, I think we need to be need to look looking at the proposal which is before us, which is essentially the removal of that condition, which which effectively would would mean that this that, that wider development scheme, which just considered, would end up having two access points as opposed to three access points for vehicle traffic. Thank you. Do any of the members wish to speak on this application? Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chair. I was hoping for a few more speakers while I got while I collected my thoughts. Uh, it appears to me to be a bit of a chicken and egg situation. And the way Mr. Rowley and Councillor Lee have described it, it seems to me that rather than work out which comes first, they'll just smash the egg. And if there's some shell in the omelette, so be it. So I'm inclined to go along with the logic of Councillor Healy here. It would seem to me the only reason this application is before us is because it's easier to ask us for permission than it is to ask Homes England to get on with the job. And again, according to Mr. Rowley, that's a bit of a four year process. I could have built it myself with a spade and a cement mixer in that time. So I, I would simply turn around to, let's be honest, Barrett and David Wilson's homes, they're not small organizations. They're not without their own departments and clout and say, don't come here to us today, go to Home England, work with them. You can deliver this project in conjunction with work with Homes England without needing to ask us to move the goalposts. So at this point, I'm hoping other councillors come in and maybe add clarity to my comments and considerations so far, but I'm, I'm not entirely satisfied again, looking at the application before us, that it even needs to be here. There are other better paths that could have been taken. Thank you, Councillor Mode. I think before I bring in others who wish to speak, I just remind members that we need to be looking at this on its merits as an individual application and not relying on the roundabout and future things which may or may not be coming forward. So what really members are being asked here is if we think it's acceptable for cars and traffic to go over that uh, public uh, right of way or not. Councillor, uh, sorry, did you wish to come in, solicitor? Councillor, that's exactly what I was, I was going to, to raise, really. I was just concerned at the root of the discussion and obviously the description of what we're, we've been applied for. Obviously, the master plan does exist for this allocation, but this is just one, one part of that and one phase. Um, and you know, I don't. I'm not aware of the fact that the master plan says on this allocation that it needs to come up, you know, first. So we just need to deal with the application before us. So we need to look at the removal of the condition and the merits of that here, rather than the the roundabout. Yeah, Councillor Whistle, you wish to come in. Thank you, Chair. I'm not going to talk about roundabouts, and not allowed to. That's pretty fair. I'm in, I'm into roundabouts before, so I think I've got away with that one. Um, we're supposed to look at the, the application in front of us and the information we've received is that this will blight a uh, much loved and much used bridleway uh, as one who appreciates much loved and much used bridleways also appreciate the, old, the open country. Uh, I do tend to find it gets me go when I see these being uh, dis destroyed or devastated by uh, roads going through them and for that reason alone, Chair, I would uh, tend to support anybody who's going to uh, make a sensible proposal against accepting this, uh, this particular application. Um, it, it, it is intensely annoying, Chair, uh, that uh, through the, the vagaries of the planning system, which we all know and love, uh, that we can't even mention things about carts being before horses. But as I can't mention that, I obviously won't, Chair. Thank you. Councillor, were you making a, a motion, proposing a motion then or not? I was hoping, Chair, that somebody might come up with a, uh, a, a reasonable uh, reason for refusing it. I want to refuse it, but I haven't got the grounds in my mind at the moment, so perhaps Councillor Meredith might help me out with that. Do you, Councillor Wilkerson, you wish to come in? Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Yeah, I, I'm sadly for Councillor Whitlar, I'm not coming up with any, any unusual things. I can't think of one either. However, um, if this committee is minded to move forward with this um, uh, application to, to remove the condition and therefore continue to cross the bridal way, um, then um, I, I would suggest that um, maybe we put in as part of the condition for that, that we put bollards on each side of the bridleway to ensure that any vehicles that do cross it cannot enter the bridleway. Um, however, horses and footpaths, etc., and cycles can, um, if I may suggest that to the officers. Is that, would that be a condition that we are happy with? Um, in the, the difficulty we have, we have though, is, in, is ensuring that, I mean, in terms of the principle, yeah, I, I fully understand what you're saying, Councillor, I, I would understand that. The difficulty we might have is whether that in itself would, would conflict with any potential uh, right-of-way legislation in terms of additional um, features being, being added to the, to the right-of-way. So one necessarily want to add a condition that ultimately could end up tripping over some other parts of the legislation that, that, that I'm not specifically aware of, because right-of-way have very strict and very um, closely regulated right legislation as to what can and can happen on the right of way itself. So um, I think what we certainly could put on, if members are to be produced, we could certainly put on an informative um, requesting that details be submitted um, to, to, to ensure that all measures are taken to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, or if members felt that the condition is necessary, we could put a decent on that um, measures are provided, I'm trying to think, that measures are provided to, to be agreed in accordance with, with officers in discussion with, with the rights of way officers. I wouldn't necessarily want to go down the route of actually saying what needs to be, what must be provided on there, because I wouldn't necessarily want to create a problem for, for later on, whereas members here would agree a condition that can't necessarily comply with rights of way legislation. So if members, my view would be an informative would be the best way to go down it, but if members insist on wanting to go down the condition route, to leave those details for officers to, to discuss with, with rights of way officers. Thank you. Did you want to come back in, Councillor Wilkinson? I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I fully understand um, what, um, what's been said, uh, uh, and I, I do not know enough about rights of way legislation to, uh, to, to suggest anything different than to what's just been said. I, I, I do find it uh, ironic, I think, is the word that we, we were talking about. We, we're not 100% sure whether we can put um, bollards in, but we can put a road over it, <laughs> so, which seems a bit ironic, but so be it. Um, I, I think an informative is probably the, the, the right way, therefore, but uh, as long as we can put something on, because I, I think if, and it's only if we are minded to approve this, um, that I am concerned that cars or motorcycles can suddenly just turn right and, and go straight down a bridle way. And let's face it, some people would, so. Thank you. Councillor Healy, you wish to come back in. I think the issue here is the integrity of the bridle way, which was why condition 18 was imposed in the first place. And I don't think putting bollards there is going to actually protect the integrity of the bridle way. And I'm kind of sensing a sort of view emanating from the committee of, of, of a kind of uh, refusal uh, of this application. And I think that what we need to think about, though, uh, clearly is, is, what, is, is what's the basis for that refusal in planning law. And I think that uh, Section 8.4 may help us with that on page 69, where the Countryside Access team are saying that um, the bridleway being crossed by vehicular traffic would harm the integrity of the rights of way network and therefore would be contrary to national policy. So I would like to move refusal of this on the grounds that vehicular traffic crossing this right of way would be contrary to national policy. So to clarify, you're moving refusal in line with the public rights of way teams, the countryside access teams comments, right? Councillor Coulter, she wished to come in. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, could I ask officers to clarify what the um, what our how is assessment is on this, and, and do they do they consider this a safe place for pedestrians and road users to share? Can highways come in and comment? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, our assessment of this from a highway development point of view is that it's acceptable to remove this condition. The condition was put on at the time because we was actually unknown where the development to the south was going to come in and we didn't want additional movements solely from Long Lane over it. 
Um, in terms of this, we're putting a race table in, so it becomes a fairly level playing field. The design speed um, of this development uh, and the um, development which it will go on to um, is 20 miles an hour. The race table will reduce that. Um, it'd be simply a case of crossing a road of speed, vehicle speeds doing between 10 and 20 miles per hour. Um, and we've had a assessment taken and the bridal wear use, um, albeit the month was, um, was, was in the winter, um, 60 two-way movements on a Sunday and then midweek, 16 um, midweek movements across the bridal wear. So therefore, we think it's acceptable to remove the condition. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Did you want to come back in, Councillor Coltish? Do any of the members wish to, Councillor Davison? Yeah, it's a conundrum, isn't it? Because um, people talk about three accesses onto the adjoining site, um, and there are only two accesses at the moment. Um, until there are at least two, um, in other words, one to the um, proposed roundabout, um, maybe there's a compromise here is that, is that um, this be permitted as a crossing until such time as uh, the, um, the roundabout link is created. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the people who, and, and somebody mentioned about school and, and Northfield and, and Cemetery Lane. Um, and I sympathise with the Long Lane residents because they've had this and didn't expect it four years ago or whatever. Um, but I just wonder if, if that's the solution is that it be closed when the, you, that, uh, that becomes a point when the roundabout is created and that link becomes the second link. I believe public rights of way have requested that, have they not, Mr. Chatfield? But highways are saying that's not necessary. Is that okay? That, 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 that's correct in terms of that. The difficulty, I understand, Council, again, through you, Chair, sorry. Um, I understand exactly where you're going with this, Council. I understand the point trying to rate. The difficulty is, is actually the practicalities of actually that happening. Because um, in terms of whether that will actually be an embarrassed gift to actually, um, to, to, um, to so essentially to, to, to reimpose the, the, those, those, those bollards at a later date. Because to be honest, once that road would have been adopted and then moved on, that their influence in that in that decision would probably would have moved on and then refer back to the council as 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 highway authority. Councillor Davison, you just come back in. Councillor Rudd. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Well, we've heard from the fire highways officers, we've heard from some of my colleagues, and I think the best solution to this is to move the officer's recommendation uh, with an informative has been suggested uh, just to see if there are ways of if you like uh, well the 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 way suggested uh, by councillor wilkinson of of, uh, of of probably uh blocking off uh, access to vehicles along uh, along that uh, that public uh, right of way but how his officers have uh, said you know it is it is quite acceptable uh, to use to, to cross that, and it has it is being done. It has been done, and I do believe that uh, this is the only solution to this particular application. So, thank you, Councillor Rudd. Uh, Councillor McMaster, you should come in. Yeah, Chair, thank you. Um, I'm going to confess to being a little lost at this stage. Are we saying? Are we suggesting that crossing the bridal way? is a temporary measure until the roundabout is complete, completed and then we'll reinstate the bridle way. Is that not what we're saying? No, this is to permanently remove the okay. bollards, which are previously conditioned to, to do that, Thank to stop uh, traffic going over this bridle way. Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I must admit, as you all are aware now, I'm irked that the advice of Morkman Wise hasn't been followed, but as we've already covered the issue of hitting the right notes in the right order, I won't go on that, and we'll instead ask a couple of questions. Does the fact that the much busier 614 crosses Long Lane actually undermine the reasons for refusal as posed by uh, Councillor uh, Healy, and w w is that in turn something that officers feel comfortable that they can A, justify, B, defend? And B, in line with Councillor Wilkinson's proposed informative, 
would collapsible bollards potentially remove any of the public right of way access issues with a lockable mechanism? You know, those have the padlock built in so that, for example, trimming maintenance could take place. Um, but similarly, your average punter can't take the car down there because they wouldn't have the ability to collapse said bollard. Yeah, just on your second point, Council Mayor, I think we're getting quite into a lot of detail there. I think well, that's the, the, the informative chair. generally that Council Wilkinson suggested about consulting the public rights of way team on what would be best is, I'd say, suffice to address that because obviously they are the experts in this field generally. Um, the other point about the main road, Mr. Uh, does Mr. Richardson or Mr. Chatfield want to respond to that? Um, <clears throat> absolutely. I think the, the aerial photograph in, in front of members is, is probably the most key thing. This is the most up-to-date Im image we have from Google Earth. Um, and in terms of, you can just see where the, where the, where the development, where those, those few houses are crossing Long Lane there. Long Lane starts in effectively where, where, the, where those, um, the residential street that comes along and then goes along where that crossing point is, and then takes a step, a 90 degree turn to the top there. And that's where the point where it crosses the 614, which is the, the main bypass for, for, for Driffield. So in terms of the, the right of way, it does go along. It starts at Long Lane with the residential street. Then you've got that relatively short section of Green Lane. And then the right hand turn goes up and then it, where it crosses the, um, the as you say, the, the, main, uh, the, the main, main bypass there with no um, pedestrian crossing points. If any of the members wish to comment on this application? No, but well, we've had a really good debate on that, which is obviously what, what we're here to do. I think for me, this all comes down to really whether you agree with the comments of either the public rights of way team slash countryside access team as the consultee for the public rights of way, or if you agree with the comments of highways as the statutory consultee for the, the highway network. I think for me, um, when initially reading the report, and um, obviously we don't ever predetermine, but I was in line with, with, with looking at thinking public right of way are absolutely right here. But that's it, why it's so important for us to always keep open minds because in going to the site visit and hearing the debate today and responses from officers and things, it's, it's quite a, a difficult one and I'm not so much in that position anymore. I think for me, the site visit was absolutely crucial um, to see this proposed crossing. And as someone who has ridden quite for quite a long time, I, I personally would not see an issue with crossing that, that, that road on that bridleway. But what I will ask, because obviously I like to make sure we are making evidence-based judgments, have the public rights of way team actually submitted any evidence to suggest that that would be detrimental in terms of traffic movements for the public rights of way? No, no, not as far as my chair. We, 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 as normal with all consultees, we consult them and then and they're, they're, we report their responses back. So what we, what we have is what we have. Because obviously they put on the condition initially um, as, as part of the wider site to protect the public rights away, but have, back then even did they provide any specific evidence to back up why that condition was added? Um, no, Chair, the, the, the condition, as I mentioned, was, was become mainly for, for precautionary measures because we, we just didn't know what's happening at phase two. So that's why it's reasonable at that stage because we'd the work hadn't been done to justify or to, to, to really set out why or how that scheme was going to come forward. And, and so it's essentially it's a precautionary condition. Now we know where we are, but that's where we're, but in terms of that condition previously, not as far as I'm aware, no. Right, that's, that's very useful to know. I mean, for me, again, I think... I, as, as, a, as a horse rider, I would have no issue with, with crossing that road when I've seen it. And particularly when you consider we're getting the, um, the raised section, which will reduce traffic speed and, and it's pretty wide open place. I think it's, I'm happy to second Councillor Rudd's proposal that we approve with the additional informative from Councillor Wilkerson just to ensure we are stopping vehicles using the public right of way. Did you wish, have you got an initial comment, Councillor Coulter? Yes, please, Chairman. Sorry, sorry to do this at the last minute. In light of everything I've heard today, I still feel unequipped to, to make a decision on this. Uh, I'm leaning towards refusal, but as we've discovered, it's quite hard to find reasons when there's a lack of evidence from public right away access team. And, and, uh, and we have some evidence from highways uh, in the contrary to that. So at this stage, I'd have to vote, I'd have to abstain unless um, anyone would like to back my proposal for a for deferral for site visit, Chairman. That was why it was deferred from the last time it came to committee. Yeah, so obviously those of us who went saw it for that reason. And I apologise, Chairman. No, I, wasn't that's, that's fine. I wasn't on this committee. Yeah, I know, I know, time. I know, I know, absolutely, that's fine. But yeah, so, Councillor Healy. Yeah, on the countryside access uh, team, I mean, this is what I'm not a bit, a bit confused about because the office is telling us that 
that they haven't submitted any evidence. And yet it's in this report, in, in, in the conclusion here. Um, there is an objection from the access team that the Bradway being crossed by vehicular traffic would harm the integrity of the rights of way network and therefore would be contrary to national policy. So is that not a reason on its own? We talk about national policy. I mean, we, 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 we very much get, get guided by national policy. So, you know, I, I take Councillor Coulter's point. He's, he's struggling to find evidence, but the countryside team have said that they're concerned about national policy. Is that not the evidence that you might think? That, that just... Well, well, look, I don't know chair, what national please. policy is, but 8.4 says it will be contrary to national but policy. Obviously, Councillor, that's, that's, that's your proposed motion, is to refuse yeah. for those reasons yeah. in line with the public right-of-way team. Yeah. I think the difficulty we have here is we have two consultees both of both both statutory arguing different things so i think you've obviously put that motion forward mm. you haven't had a secondary at this point yet um, unless that's what council <laughs> Cortish is wanting to do Thank you're you. seconding councillor healy yeah. for those reasons we also have a motion for approval with the additional informative from councillor wilkinson proposed by councillor rudd and seconded by myself um and did you want to speak on that second Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to clarify, uh, I'll second Councillor Healy's motion on the grounds of residents who are the ones who are complaining on this and local experts, the people who live there, have no grounds of appeal, but big developers do have grounds of appeal. So I'll second Councillor Healy's motion, Chairman. Obviously, that's not, not a material planning reason to, to support I, that, it, but I think... In that's line, my reasons for supporting it. I'm, I'm supporting his Councillor reasons Healy in is, the motion. Is the reason in line with the public the countryside access team's concerns and objection. Um, so we have two motions on the table, John. Which one do we need to take first to refuse all the approval? The approval first, because that was the one that was first proposed and then seconded. Uh, and then depending on what happens to that, you would then move to the refusal proposal, uh, depending if the original motion is successful or not. Right, so we have a proposal from Councillor Rudd and myself to approve the application subject to an additional informative Sorry, to defer and delegate approval to officers, subject to an additional informative to try and consult with the public rights of way team to see if we can get some sort of bollard or, or such thing to protect the integrity of the bridleway from vehicles driving down it. All those in favour of that motion? Five, Chairman. All those against? Five, Chairman. Any abstentions? No, it's one, two. Sorry, could I just show of hands again, please? One, two, three. Six. Councillor Mary, you put your hand up properly, please. Six, Chairman. So the motion falls and you, you revert to the proposal of refusal. So we have the proposal of refusal from Councillor Healy, seconded by Councillor Coultish uh, for the reasons of the objection of the public rights of way team. All those in favour of refusal? Six, Chairman. All those against? Five, Chairman. The application is therefore refused. We'll now move on to agenda item seven. I think members will cover this one, then we'll have a short break. Um, but item seven, the construction of an asphalt plant at Brands Burton. Can we have the officers update, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this, this, proposal, this proposal seeks full planning permission for the construction of an asphalt plant direction of a storage building and associated works. And the process involves the coating of road stone with bitumen using a directly heated batch coating with a maximum of 100 tonnes of bitumen produced per hour. The site was previously allocated for employment, industrial development and benefits from planning permission for such development. Um, and there's references to an 89 and a 2006 permission. Um, the latter is the, uh, the, the applicant's fallback position. No objections from technical statutory consultees, including Highway Development Management, Public Protection, Natural England, Nature Conservation and Ecology, Conservation, Lead Local Flood Authority, and the Land Drainage Teams. Since the Planning Committee report was published, officers confirmed that trees outside and adjacent to the western boundary are on highway land maintained by the Council. Chair, there is a, 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 clar a clarification on point 1.2 in that the, the proposal will require a permit, but this will not be from the Environment Agency. It will be granted by the, the, the local authority. Um, the proposed plant requires a local authority permit to operate in addition to planning 
permission that has been applied for and is still and the permit application is still being considered by the council's public, public protection team the permit seeks to control air quality odor dust and noise from the operation of the proposed asphalt plant um, through strict the application of strict conditions chair the planning agent has confirmed that operational asphalt plants in hull and friday for which are referred to by some objectors and uh, one of the parish councils are not comparable with this proposal. The whole asphalt plant is double in size in terms of output. And as a result, the scale of the development is considerably larger in terms of the building height and the layout due to plant infrastructure requirements. The Friday for asphalt plant forms part of a wider development, including a quarry and recycling plant. And it has been uh, in operation, we estimate for about 20 years. Chair, 18 additional third party I, members of the public objections have been received, increasing the total number of objections to 376. The grounds raised chair with the additional objections are those set out in the planning committee report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright. We have three speakers for this application. Firstly, we have a Mr. Olson, who is the objector and is joining us by Zoom. Mr. Olson, can you hear me? I can, yes. Mr. Olson, you have five minutes to address the committee with your views. Mr. Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. You will be aware that the application has generated significant opposition in the Bransberton and adjacent areas, with a number of neighbouring parish councils lodging their objections. 376 objectors have registered their concerns, which should not be underestimated and shows the breadth of feeling in our community. Indeed, the application is widely regarded as being one of the most controversial applications in a lifetime. These objectors are unanimous in their view. The proposed development will have a very negative and severe impact upon the local environment and its population. For such a controversial application, it is difficult to process the radio silence from the applicants with no effort made whatsoever to engage with our community in a bid to try and relieve the fears this development would bring. Numerous reports from respected sources testify to the fact that asphalt plants are a danger to health and the environment. It is difficult to reconcile these respected findings with the environmental control district and specialist reports undertaken. The objections you have in front of you are not knee-jerk reactions. For instance, the Bransburton Parish Council submission is based upon two councillors visiting three asphalt plants one in Jewsbury run by the company involved in this application, one in Hull and one on the outskirts of Norwich. Their findings were unanimous, detrimental impacts, even in the very industrial context in which they were cited, unlike the perimeter of a rural community such as this proposal. Comments from residents on the outskirts of Norwich state that they cannot open windows or use gardens as they wish. Despite assurances and no doubt comforting similar reports, dust, noise and odours are major issues. These findings are common across all sites visited. I know that the planning committee have undertaken a site visit of the proposed development and the planning officer has recommended an approved decision. Unless a site visit has been undertaken at a live asphalt plant within the Hull and East Yorkshire area and the committee members can experience firsthand the detrimental impacts these operations have on the surrounding areas, the planning committee with respect are not in a suitably informed position to make a decision today based solely on a recommendation. Catfuss Lane is home to a number of businesses, including farming, but not the kind of heavy polluting industry represented by this application. The general consensus is that asphalt plants should be a minimum of three kilometres from residential areas. This proposal, as you can see, is far closer to our village, its school, and expanding sports facilities East Riding of Yorkshire Council have recently approved. Having reviewed the environmental control reports, it is concerning that neither of those reports reference an entire community is situated less than one kilometre from the proposed site. I have very little confidence in the data presented. Visual impact statements are less than precise and operating hours together with traffic predictions are either inconsistent or questionably low. It is even suggested in reports that once established, extensions and expansion could be sought an even more concerning prospect. Furthermore, and with respect, I believe that the controls that may be employed will be difficult to monitor and enforce. Has appropriate due diligence been undertaken with the applicants to understand if and how many environmental and regulatory breaches have been reported within their existing operations? The highways assessment suggests that there will be around 62 vehicle movements per day split between HGVs, smaller lorries of 7.5 tonne or less, 
and staff movements. This feels very conservative and does not reconcile with the operational outputs of 100 tonne per hour. You will also see from objections raised that these traffic concerns loom large. The highways assessment suggests that the additional vehicle movements will not have a detrimental impact on the safety or operation of the local highways. Anyone who uses the A165 between Bridlington and Bransburton will know this A road is very busy. Slow moving vehicles entering and exiting Catfus Lane will undoubtedly have a detrimental impact on the local highways network. East Riding of Yorkshire Council are well aware of the traffic problems in the area and this proposal will make them infinitely worse. I would also suggest that the local economy will suffer substantially if the proposal is approved. It is hard to see any economic benefits and very e easy to see the devastating impact it will have on the leisure and tourism businesses, which have steadily grown in recent years. Page 124 of the draft local plan suggests that more camping and touring caravan parks should be encouraged within the Yorkshire world. It is difficult to imagine a less welcome industrial operation one which will undoubtedly inhibit the expansion of existing leisure facilities in, left. in Bransburton and any new facilities from opening in the future. Finally, this proposal is diametrically opposed to the positive environmental policies of East Riding of Yorkshire Council and contradicts climate change concerns on a wider front. It is a wholly inappropriate development for our community that the members should firmly reject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The second speaker is the applicant who's also joining us via Zoom, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you too. Mr. Brown, you too have five minutes to address the committee. And Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains. Your time starts when you start speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Brown and I'm the operations director at Newley Asphalt. We're a small independent asphalt company currently situated in Dewsbury, West Yorkshire producing quality coated roadstone materials, something most of us use every day. While supplying materials into East Yorkshire on a regular basis, it's come to our attention through further research that a large percentage of asphalt materials currently used in East Yorkshire comes from the West Yorkshire region, resulting in thousands of unnecessary road miles per year. <clears throat> this led us to look at finding a site in East Yorkshire to which we found the part in Brands Burton. Ideally positioned in central East Yorkshire, we previously pl approved planning permission for industrial use. As you will be aware, your policies direct us towards such sites. In visual terms, we have demonstrated that the proposal shall not have any unacceptable effect, particularly when placed in the context of the approved development on the site and the well-established tree belt, which will be retained. The site itself has excellent road links to all major routes in East Yorkshire allowing us to avoid travelling through local villages, as is demonstrated by the EHO approved noise and air quality assessments. The proposal is acceptable in residential amenity terms. All ash park plants in the UK have UK environmental permits applied to them, which require us to follow strict regulations and live monitoring processes. We've been doing this at our Dewsbury site since 2014 with no non-conformances. We also implement ISO 9001 quality management system, an ISO 14001 environmental management system, and a UKCA factory production control system with all our materials produced to strict British standards. We are now investing in warm mix asphalt, allowing us to produce materials 40 degrees less than current materials, reducing odour by up to 90% and a 25% reduction in fossil fuel used. I hope you can see that New Lay Ashar as a company is heavily invested to making advancements in environmental processes, reducing our carbon footprint. <clears throat> as part of our applications, it's important to us to encourage wildlife to exist along our, alongside our business. So we've included the addition of owl, box, owl and bat boxes on site with extra grass and planted areas. We're aware this application has been met with some concern from local parish councils and residents. But I'd like to clear a couple of things up which have been mentioned on social media and local press regarding emissions. Most of the objections on the planning portal have referred to a Google article on an asphalt plant in America, where it used to be common practice to use heavy fuel oils in the process of drying aggregate. This is not the case in the UK, where we use light fuels with a high percentage of bio oils. We consider we have more than demonstrated the suitability of the proposed development 
in highway, amenity and visual terms. The site is consented for employment uses and we will employ around 12 people with positive benefits into the wider East Riding economy. We recognise that the scheme has attracted local objections, but your officers have assessed the scheme in considerable detail and have come to the same conclusion as ourselves that this is an acceptable scheme. On this basis, I urge you to follow your officers' recommendations and those of the highway and EHO in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our final speaker on this item is one of the local ward members, Councillor Everson, who joins us here in the chamber. Councillor Everson, you have five minutes. Mr. Weiner will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, you've heard and read the issues concerning this application, so I'll try and keep my contributions very much to the point. I want to make it clear that I'm very much in favour of encouraging new startup businesses. And a gap in the market has been identified by Newlay Asphalt, and I wish them every success. However, as one of the ward councillors, I'm also very aware of local concerns. 376 is the figure mentioned of registered objectors, which include objections from surrounding parish councils, Brands Burton, Leven, Cattick, and North Frodingham listing the impact on environment and damage to leisure and tourism as some of the areas of concern. Quite simply, I do not believe the issue is about objecting to the construction of an asphalt plant, but objection to the location. And I am adding my voice and also asking that you refuse the application on this site. There is no question that there is a planning permission in place for employment development on the site. But I would like to draw your attention to the existing business already operating on Capus Industrial Estate and the fact the site is quite clearly in open countryside surrounded by farming. For those who attended the site visit, you will have witnessed Capus Industrial Estate consists of a number of businesses, all light industry. Caravan storage, timber and builders merchant, dog kennels and cattery all existing in a rural setting surrounded by farmland on one of the well-used routes to Attic and Fargrange Caravan site and Low Skirlington site, all tourism locations. There's a great deal of concern over the environmental impact of this application, citing dust, noise and odour as main concerns, with the site being in close proximity to residential developments of Brands Burton and tourist sites. The local farmer who farms the surrounding fields is, is contracted to grow peas to be harvested and frozen. The soil must be tested regularly for any signs of contamination. And the farmer has also raised concerns over drainage and potential flood risk. You can imagine his grave concerns over this application being granted. As I've already mentioned, Catfus Lane is, well, is a well-used route to tourism locations. The A165 is also the main road into Bridlington. In the East Riding, we've worked hard to expand our tourism offer, encouraging quality locations for visitors and making much of the beautiful rural countryside available to visitors and what they will expect to see when they get here. My objection is not against the asphalt plant in principle, but I feel strongly this is not the right location. It would be out of keeping with existing light industry on Catfus Industrial Estate. Its location affects two main routes to tourism destination and impacts on existing tourist sites in the village of Bransburton. There is potential for detrimental effect on surrounding farming activity. Introduction of a large alien industrial business in open countryside, which will be very visible, especially from Catfus Lane. In short, this isn't a suitable site for this type of employment use due to the impact on the character and appearance on the surrounding area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Everson. That's all of our speakers on this application. So I'll now open it up to the committee. I have Councillor Whistle wishing to speak. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Chair. And it was nice to see members uh, on the site visit and I hope that you did take on board uh, the comments which uh, Councillor Everson has just made regarding the use 
currently of this site, which is largely light industrial, uh, which is unlikely, shall we say, to affect the delicate nostrils of either Brandsburg residents or indeed any tourists. I agree wholeheartedly with Councillor Harrison. Uh, this is adjacent to my ward, and I've heard comments from my residents as well, uh, fears about an asphalt plant. And they are indeed fears, Chair. And I think the fears are justified. Councillor Everson referred to a, 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 an alien industrial plant uh, in the open countryside. Okay, it's, it's approved it's in the planning documents for industrial use, but it's alien to the industrial use which is taking place there now. And we are, whilst not being experts in the field of asphalt uh, coating of roadstone at the rate of 100 tonnes an hour, uh, I can utilise my imagination to suggest that that is going to be a heck of a racket, uh, as you see them going down from the hoppers into the wagons below. And that's just the start of it, Chair, because on top of that, you've got all the, the concomitant uh, pollutants, which this process will inevitably uh, send out uh, into the atmosphere. Like Councillor Everson, I have no objection whatsoever to people popping at asphalt plants. I mean, it's necessary, we all drive on roads. But please, can we have a bit of common sense about this and put these asphalt plants in the right place? This is half a kilometre away from Brandsburton Village. Brandsburton, in case you didn't get through it on your way past from your, your site visit, is a, a, a vibrant little village. It has a couple of nice pubs uh, and it acts as a base for the tourists who reside in the caravan sites around and also as a base for the people who use the water sports facilities just down the road. Can you imagine how it would be if you, as, as a visitor to a caravan park, which you've been going to for many years, suddenly have this planking monstrosity just down the road? Would you be proud to take friends to your caravan and say, this is our lovely countryside. Oh, and look, that's the new asphalt plant, the very kindly built down the road for you to look at and admire. No, I don't think, Chair, that you would. My inclination is to um, move refusal of this application, Chair. I would move refusal on the grounds of uh, residential amenity. I would move refusal on the grounds of uh, it being out of keeping for the current site that it is uh, supposed to be on. I would also move refusal, Chair, I'm just hoping that one of these might stick, uh, on the impact of the local farming and also the tourism industries. Now, if I don't get a seconder for a refusal, Chair, I reserve the right to come back with a second um, proposal, which I shall keep under my non-existent hat for the time being. Thank you, Chair. I've noted that down. Are officers satisfied with those reasons for refusal? I think in terms of looking at this, bearing in mind that this application, also, if, if members couldn't consent for this, it would require a permit. Um, the, the response from the public protection officers is based on the information that they've already seen, um, the odour and noise and so on and so forth are, are actually acceptable to them and they're currently processing an application for a permit. So I think the visual impact issue in terms of the, um, the, the, the as, as Councillor Whittle has just set out, is, is a, a more a reasonable reason for approval rather than going down the issues of specifics that are covered by the permit. Um, so, in answer to your question, Chair, yes. Thank you. I have Councillor Jump wishing to speak next. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about my voice, it's about to go. Um, I obviously didn't go on the site visit because I'm, I'm substituting on the committee today, but I looked at the location and it surprised me because the company's actually from the West Riding. There must be somewhere closer to the West Riding than Brands Burton which wouldn't involve going through a lot of country lanes. I'm also concerned about the acceptability of smell. What might be acceptable on paper is not always acceptable to the humans who have to suffer it. There's always that little bit of variance. Obviously, some people are more susceptible to smell than others. So, I, And as this, yes, is already down as a light industrial site, this is not what I would call light industrial, and it certainly doesn't seem to fit in with the businesses that are already there. So at, at the present moment, I don't feel I can support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jump. Do any of the members wish to speak? Councillor Healy? Yeah, uh, 
I was, I, I think just from reading the documentation, um, there are a lot of concerns. Um, and in particular, the environmental control district team. And I was almost, I was you know, very concerned when I read there that they say that the odor impact assessment uh, recognizes that the process has the potential to give off odor emissions in the form of polyaromatic hydrocarbons and volatile organic compounds. And that the Institute of Air Quality Management refers to these odors as high offensiveness. That is extremely concerning. I mean, I take the point of the company that they're trying to do their bit for the environment by reducing road traffic movements by putting their plant here rather than in Dewsbury. But I don't think it sticks when you compare that against this. Um, and further on, that the odor potential from the mixing process is deemed to be high. But then they go on to say, well, actually, we're not going to be doing much mixing. We're only doing it as required. Um, I'm not, I've got no uh, I full understanding of the fact that we've had 350 objections from this because um, it, it, it is going to have a very, very significant impact, I think, on people's quality of life, whether they, if they live in Bransburton or whether they uh, are tourists. Um, and I think that's a compelling case to be made by the ward councillor on behalf of her residents and her parish councils, that this is something that is not acceptable. I also think that um, we appear to have got some strong reasons for refusal, um, helpfully clarified again by, by Mr. Wainwright in terms of visual impact. Uh, and on that basis, I am prepared to second Councillor Whittle's motion of refusal. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Can I just ask officers to clarify in terms of obviously the pollution aspects, the odour and stuff, that's obviously covered by public protection. And in planning terms, public protection haven't objected. Sure. And then obviously everything else will be covered by their potential permit. So I, what I just yeah. want is members stick to looking at from a planning point of view, like visual impact, rather than stuff that are out of our control. That's, abs that's, <laughs> that's absolutely correct, what you just said. Um, the report goes into some detail Public protection go into some detail about breaking out the constitu breaking down the constituent elements of how you bring the material onto the site, how you process it, and the opportunities for emissions in terms of particularly in terms of air quality and odor. And they conclude that on the basis of the information they they've received, that there isn't a an objection on those grounds. But as I say, as the chair is absolutely right that, that there is a, a duplicate um, level of control that will be applied to this by the the light any permit. There will be a be issued by public protection and that will control odour and, and, and noise. Thank you. Count, uh, Councillor Copsey, you wish to come in. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not particularly happy with this application, I must admit, but I, I, I feel I must level the playing field a little bit here. Light industry. Part of cabin construction is not, in my mind, light industry. And there are several... Um, Potter cabin construction factories down that road. Not storage, but construction. And I've, you know, furthermore, I, I, I don't feel that they, uh, there's no scheme there for landscaping. I'd like to see if, if we are minded to pass this at all, further landscaping included in this, um, in this application. And, and I, I would, I prefer to move deferral on this one until such landscaping scheme is in place. So Councillor Copsey proposing that we defer for an additional uh, landscape scheme to be submitted. I am. Well, Councillor Wilkinson wishing to come in next. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I am minded of what was just said um, um, by Mr. Wainwright. Uh, I, I, and I, I am pleased that you mentioned that. I, as you're aware, working in the health and safety industry for quite some time, I am a little concerned about the fact um, that we're not supposed to be putting houses uh, or wind farms uh, within 600 metres of a house, um, and we wouldn't think of it. Yet we're talking here about uh, a plant that produces um, toxic chemicals into the atmosphere, um, with houses closer than that, which concerns me a little. Um, there are many case studies out there, and I'm surprised that none of them have been quoted by our protection people, that state that the production of 
um, um, tarmac uh, and, and these, uh, this bitumen product um, produces highly toxic chemicals. Um, I think even some of the, um, uh, the objectors raised that very point. One of the areas that it does is that many uh, productions produce toxic chemicals. That's, that's a fact of life. We can't get away from that within our modern world. But what we do is normally give a distance away from those so that air quality gets better and better the further away you get because it gets diluted. But the advice is around three kilometers. And yet here we are much closer than that, um, producing formaldehyde and arsenic um, at, at levels that most places actually stayed, I, I, are not good within the a 400 meter range. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can do anything about it within this, but I am concerned that yet again, um, our public protection people have not come up and discussed this within this particular report for us to look at. It wasn't long ago that the entire world talks about silica sand being dangerous for people and our um, public protection completely ignored it. And now we're getting a fact that Everybody discusses, and we have, you only need to go on the internet and find hundreds of, of case studies regarding this production that produces toxic chemicals. And yet we're not discussing it. We're discussing odor, not toxic chemicals. So I would ask, could our public protection people please get up to date? You know, if they need a health and safety expert, come and see me, but this is not good. Thank you. So, sorry, Council Wilson, were you suggesting asking for further evidence on public protection? Yes, absolutely. Would you like to fit that in with Councillor uh, uh, Copsey's motion for deferral in general anyway? I think that would be an excellent idea. Thank you for that. Councillor Copsey, are you happy to, to second that, uh, to agree to that as a proposer? And are you formally seconding the proposal, Councillor Wilkins? Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Whittle, who should come back in. Yes, thank you, Chair. If uh, this proposal uh, to defer were to go through, Chair, I would like to add to it a corollary uh, that, uh, bearing in mind that not all of us are health and safety experts, and very few of us are actually have experience of producing asphalt-coated roadstone, uh, that we incorporate a site visit to a comparable facility so we can ex uh, examine it for ourselves and see what the result is from that. Thank you, Chair. Is that possible, uh, Mr. Wayne? Because I know from other applications we've struggled when, when we've not had it under the applicant's ownership before locally. Chair, I think the applicant said that they operate a comparable site in, in Dewsbury in West Yorkshire. Um, if, if members decide to defer for a site visit, it's important that they, they get members go and have a look at a comparable site because a lot of the concerns have been raised about this general industry, but it's been based on uncomparable sites. So there is a, a possibility of a site visit to, to see a a comparable site that would you'd have to leave that for the officers to ensure that that was uh, that was appropriate i mean members have deferred applications for site visits to look at these type of facilities in the past and i think many many years ago we drove all the way down to cambridge but uh, i'm not proposing that so somewhere in the in the area where we can find a comparable site would be appropriate are council copsey and council wilkinson happy to add that to their motion for deferral i think that's an excellent idea but can i suggest that we don't all go in separate cars <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yes, so Councillor Copsey, yes to Councillor McMaster. It's okay, thank you, Chair. I was going to say, I was going to propose um, we postpone uh, any decision until a site visit, but that's obviously been taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Well, um, I, I will certainly be supporting the deferral, uh, but I, I would certainly uh, like to uh, ask if we could. Uh, as part of this deferral, uh, have details of the permit, please, uh, that, that has been applied for, actual details of it, so that we can see what they actually say. I think Councillor Wilkinson's part of the deferral to get further information from public uh, protection, obviously they're dealing with the permit, so we can get that from them as part of that. Do any of the members wish to, Councillor Meredith? Thank you, Chair. 
But uh, just going through everybody's comments so far, I can completely understand the visual amenity perspective. And we're talking about a 14 meter structure. That's a, a very obvious and clear cut point of view and a, a valid concern to raise. To an extent, I can also understand the residential amenity and that's both you know the noise and the smell impact, the general disturbance to an environment. I get that too. But the problem I do have is that I don't think we can make an informed decision for all the reasons we've covered. Um, but we've had uh, the object of Mr. Olson and Councillor Everson talk about the poisoning of, uh, of local fields. But ultimately, 90% of the East Riding is agricultural. If we don't put it here, we put it somewhere else. That problem will still be the same. So on top of the public protection um, information, on top of the permit information, on top of the possible planting information and increased screening, I'd also be very grateful for any future information that could be provided on the ability to put it in a pressurised environment. I'm thinking of some of the anaerobic digesters that we have in the area where the pressure inside the building is lesser than the pressure outside, which in turn stops leakage. Now, if someone were to turn around to me and say, well, we can't do that because we'll be trapping all the harmful chemicals, I think we've given credence to some of the other arguments. Um, but with that in mind, I'd be grateful to know if that is possible. I mean, I, I, I'll bring the officer in a minute, but I'd just say, obviously, we have to look at what's before us and not lead the applicant to what perhaps we may approve in future and what not. We should it's look not, what's it's not about what Do the officers want to answer Councillor Meredith's question? Chair, I think you're absolutely right. Although it's, an it's a very interesting sort of um, proposal. I think members have got to focus exactly on what is in front of us. And members have also got to be aware that the MPPF is very clear in terms of the control that other agencies bring forward to regulate developments, such as what we're talking about today. Should, almost, should be taken as being exactly that, that they will regulate it to ensure that the environment is actually protected. Um, you know, we've all got examples of where it's failed and that, but I think by bringing back the details of the, of the actual um, permit process in a bit more detail, that should give members the, uh, the, the comfort to show clearly what planning controls and what the, the permit will control. Thank you, do any other members wish to come in on this application? No. Um, I think for me, I completely agree with Councillor Copsey regarding landscaping. The, the site visit, as usual, I, I like site visits. It was very useful to see that there is no landscaping protection on that site for the uh, nearest village, which is Brands Burton. So absolutely, there needs to be additional landscaping on this site, particularly on that eastern boundary there for me to support the application. So I would support that element of the deferral, absolutely, from Councillor Copsey. One question I do have for officers is, in terms of principle, obviously, we know that there's a now a redundant um, business application previously approved for this site, and it was once allocated for employment use. What class of employment use was it previously allocated for, and what class of use was previously approved for the site? And is it the same as this class of use that's being proposed now? Yeah, thank you, Chair. The, 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 there is paragraph 1.3 sets out the previous history of the site and it's clear that um, two permissions have been granted that have been lawfully implemented one for one in July 19, 1989 and one in 2006 though both those applications were B1 B2 and B8 um, operations so this is a B we've considered officers consider this to be a B2 operation uh, an industrial operation that would fall within what's been granted consent in the past so in terms of the principle the applicant's got a fallback it's already been established Appreciate that the site's no longer allocated, but in terms of those previous uses, uh, officers considered that this use fits within that, that, that those use classes. So to clarify, because obviously there's been talk about light industry, what's not light industry. In terms of planning principle, this site has historically been approved for B2 use, which is what this is. So principle is established for this use on the site. That's very good to know. For me, um, as I said, mainly for the landscape issues, but also it'd be good to know more about Public protection's view on this. I'm happy to support the deferral uh, proposed by Councillor Copsey and seconded by Councillor Wilkinson, particularly if, if they agree to get substantially more landscaping on the eastern boundary, I think is absolutely key to protect residents, both from visual noise and any other form of pollution. Obviously, we'll leave that to the pub for public protection to clarify. Mr. Wiley, we have two motions, one for refusal from councillors Whittle and councillors Healy and the deferral that I've just explained. Which one do we need to take first? Chairman, the deferment is the uh, amendment to the original proposal. So you would need to vote on that first, subject to what you decide. You would then either vote on what's called the substantive motion or you would then fall back to the original motion if the, if the amendment is lost. 
So councillors Copsey and Wilkinson are proposing that we defer the application for additional landscaping, particularly on the eastern boundary of the site, and for further information from public protection regarding how they've come to the conclusion of no. Councillor Whittle, do you want to this come in? The site visit as well, Chairman. I was just councillor. Site visit as well. Yes, I was, I was about to read that, and also the site visit at a, an equal site, most likely under the applicant's ownership, I imagine. Um, so we're happy to vote on that, members. All those in favour of that deferral? It's 11, Chairman. 11, Chairman. So the, um, the, the amendment is carried. You now have to vote on it again because it becomes a substantive motion in case there's any further amendments people want to propose. All those in favour of that substantive motion? 11 again, Chairman. The application is therefore deferred for the reasons we've just explained. Uh, members, would members of the committee like to have a break now, since we have been going for nearly two and a half hours for a quick refreshment and come back? And it's also getting very hot in here. Shall we propose that we have a 10 minute adjournment and all come back here for 25 to? Thank you.
We'll just wait for our two committee members to return. Okay, everyone's back now, so we'll start the meeting again. The next application is item eight on the agenda, which is the variation of conditions at land north of Woodcock Road, Flamborough. Could we have the officer's update, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, sorry, um, yeah, there's a bit of an update to this one, so just members bear with me. Uh, members will recall this application was considered by committee in April, uh, and at that committee, amended plans were submitted which showed that the dwellings were being constructed approximately between 0.3 and 0.45 metres higher than had previously been approved. And amended section plans were submitted to show the relationship with neighbours. Members on that committee resolved to delegate approval of the scheme, subject to no new issues being raised. However, post-committee, an objection was received, which stated that the proposed plans showing the relationship with neighbours was incorrect. Officers then arranged for the council's own surveyors to recheck the levels between the identified dwellings. <clears throat> Excuse me. This found that section AA between plots three and four and 16 Woodcock Road was incorrect with a difference of 0.77 metres between the floor levels as, as opposed to 0.41 metres. And as such, the difference in levels was greater than was previously considered by members. However, as was shown through the surveying uh, details we had, the difference between plots six and seven and 13 Woodcock Road was found to be 1.03 metres, which is actually in fact slightly lower than actually shown previously on the section FF and between plots 10 and 11 Woodcock Road was approximately the same at 0.5 metres. Amended plans have now been received, which shows these corrected levels, and they're, they're the ones in your pack. Revised schemes, revised plans have also been submitted, which show plots, which show the ridges of plots 5, 13, and 14 to be 0.44 metre higher than previously considered by members, and plots 17, 20, 30, 31, and 40 have revised dormer arrangements. And further plots 13 and 31 that show revised floor plans with the roof, roof bedroom being divided, subdivided internally to create um, two bedrooms so as to form five bedroom dwellings as opposed to four bedroom dwellings. And again, the, 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 these plans are contained within, within your pack um, and have been subject to reconsultation. And it's for, for these reasons that the, the, these plans are referred back to members for further consideration. Uh, further, further to members' request also, the, the scheme now proposes to identify 23 dwellings as being rendered uh, as opposed to just being brick in, in accordance with, with members' previous, previous instructions. Since the previous committee, we have three further letters of objection, and uh, these, these raise the points so that the dwellings are being built too high, the builder should have stopped building, the properties, existing properties have been robbed of privacy, and residents could have lived with the properties being three foot lower, bedrooms are already in the roof space, Permitted developments must be removed. Permitted development rights must be removed, I'm sorry. Unacceptable degree of overlooking. Members should visit the site. And the conditions imposed by the outline and reserved matters have not been addressed. And therefore, the planning permission is not lawful. Application is about three things. It's about the change to house styles, increase in the number of three and four beds, and the introduction of five bedroom houses, and the use of gray brick and black roofs. No objections to different house styles, but. No, no, so no objections are proposed to different house styles, but to larger houses. I'm not sure what, uh, uh, but larger houses are not what flamboyant. Flam I'll start again. Uh, there's no objections to the different house styles, but larger houses are not what flamboyant needs. Uh, proposed mitigation measures don't go far enough. Condition seven should be amended so as not so as not to allow deliveries on site at 7 a.m. on a Saturday, which should be 8 a.m. consistent with Monday to Friday. And also, if gardens are made level. This will put pressure on existing boundary walls and could cause them to collapse. However, members, overall, mem officers are, are satisfied that these changes, as previously mentioned, do not result in any significant adverse effect on residential amenity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chatfield. We have four speakers on this application. First is a Mr. Moore, the objector, who is joining us here in the chamber. Mr. Moore, you have five minutes to address the committee with your views. Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Chair, members, I'm speaking to object to this planning variation on behalf of Flamborough Residents Association. Flamborough is an attractive village with many chalk built cottages with pantiles in the older parts, but with the remainder made up predominantly of red brick dwellings with red tiles and the occasional slate roof. 
The development house planning permission and in the original form would have been an asset to the village community. But the variation before you today transforms it into a carbuncle. The variation has two parts. Firstly, the use of bricks and roofing tiles that are alien to the village. Secondly, the change of style and size of house. A third element has however been confirmed by an East Riding survey of ground levels. Some houses have floor levels that are over a meter higher than intended. Add to this the extra three courses of bricks. Please see the display pictures, which although not shown on the plans before you, have been inserted by the developer to increase the third floor space. And you have buildings that tower 1.3 meters over the existing properties and dominate this part of the village. Concerning the issue of brick and tile color, we can say no reason for departing from the traditional colors that are used in the village. Even though planning permission has not been granted, the developer has already constructed a number of the houses with this color combination. It's therefore not a theoretical exercise in what the visual harm has been caused. It is there for all to see. The development could well suit a town landscape, but in an attractive village like Flamborough, the color combination should complement the surroundings rather than clash with them. Gray bricks and black tiles are totally alien and should not be used in Flamborough let alone on a state of 54 houses. The second part of the application is about changing the style of the houses built. The variation, variation is all about increasing the number of bedrooms and properties. Your strategic housing market assessment 2019 models the authority's housing needs until 2039. Please see the displayed slide. You'll see that I've compared the East Riding need assessment with the original approved application and the variation you're considering. The original planning approval very closely followed this identified need, but the variation distorts in the favor of, la favor of larger houses. With the number of one bedroom properties remains the same, Two bedroom properties are reduced from 20 to nine. Three bedroom properties are increased from 22 to 27. Four bedroom properties are increased by 50% and five bedroom properties are introdu introduced. The number of four and five bedroom houses is two and a half times the need identified. The question must be, who will buy these large houses? They would no doubt make ideal investments to be used as holiday lets or Airbnbs. I was optimistic that the balance of the original approval would give Flamborians a chance to get onto the property ladder or to slightly upsize. If this is the past, that will not be the case. The variation that you are being asked to approve today is essentially about the number of bedrooms in the properties and the colors of the bricks and tiles. As the original permission had sizes of houses that mirrored your strategic housing need assessment and the variation doesn't and gray br brick and black tiles are not sympathetic to the village environment, your decision surely must be to simply refuse them. The fact that the developer has ignored council advice and continued to build houses that he does not have planning permission for should not affect this decision. Please reject this unreasonable variation or at least defer and come and see for yourself the scale you, of Mark, the problem. Your time. The second speaker is Mr. Flatman, the applicant's agent who is joining us via Zoom. Mr. Flatman, can you hear me? Mr. Flatman, can you hear me? 
Yes, Chair, sorry, <laughs> I can hear you. We can hear you. Mr Flatman, you have five minutes to address the committee with your views. Mr Wiley here will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Planning Committee. My name is Alistair Flatman and I'm the Planning Consultant for the applicant for Land Homes. Given the comprehensive nature of the committee report before you and the positive recommendation, I do not propose to say too much this afternoon. However, I would like to reiterate a couple of key points in respect of the proposal. As set out in the report, this application has been brought back to members following completion of an independent survey of proposed dwellings and those existing along Woodcock Road. This survey has provided the basis for the plans before you this afternoon. At the April committee, members were advised of raised ground levels required as part of the roads and drainage infrastructure agreed with your officers. The survey information now gives details of ridge heights for the new dwellings. The survey identified that some ridge heights were lower than previously approved, whilst others are taller by between 15 and 45 centimetres. The plans considered in April showed an increased ridge of up to 30 centimetres, so plans have been updated to reflect this 15 centimetre difference. As previously explained in April, changes in heights often occur during construction due to variations in brick sizes and mortar depths, together with allowance for reinforcement between courses. This remains the case. The developer has not intentionally raised the height of the dwellings. They remain two-storey dwellings with room in the roof, as approved under the original reserve matters. The proposed amends simply seek to use the roof space as previously approved with dormers located to the front, whilst VLUX windows on the rear are similar to those previously approved and will not give rise to any overlooking or loss of privacy. As previously agreed, we are amenable to the additional conditions removing permitted development rights and the construction of a new tall fence along the rear boundaries. The survey has been a very useful exercise and whilst revisions have been made, it, has, it remains the case that the proposed dwellings will not give rise to any significant design or residential amenity issues. The ridges for the new dwellings are circa 27 to 28 metres from the rear properties of Woodcock Road and as such, Increases in height will not give rise to any material change in those planning issues considered when approving the original reserve matters scheme. External alterations to material and window design on some plots were considered acceptable when discussed by members in April. However, as set out in the report and confirmed in your officer's update, the developer has agreed to further variations in materials as requested by members in April. The change in mix arising from the alterations to internal layouts reflects the demand for three bedroom family dwelling with space for home working whilst provision of four and five bed dwelling seeks to meet an identified need in Flamborough. Again, this was discussed and accepted in April. This demand has been realized by the high levels of interest in these family homes. And so naturally the developer is keen to secure your support today so sales can be completed. As you will appreciate, delays to planning can have a detrimental effect on commercial viability of the project and delivery of homes on this allocated site. To that end, the revised section 106 has been agreed with your legal team and signed. Um, it's noted that there's no objections from any consultees uh, and comments made by local residents have been addressed in the committee report and by the update. Um, we note the objector's comments in his presentation about the delivery hours on a Saturday and again would be amenable to that condition being revised at eight o'clock. Um, in light of the above, we welcome the positive recommendation before you and respectfully request that you support officer's recommendation to approve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Flatman. The next speaker on this application is the local ward councillor, Councillor Chris Matthews. Councillor Matthews, you two have five minutes to address the committee. Mr Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and the time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll try not to duplicate what Mr Moore has already said about his objection. Um, before coming on to Cabinet, I sat on various planning committees for 12 years. And as a consequence, I'm very much aware of the challenges of retrospective planning applications and the need to be very clinical in any decision-making. I say retrospective that although it's, we've got a title here of a variation, work has already been undertaken, meaning it is a retrospective planning application to my mind. I wasn't present when the original planning application was considered. However, I understand that issues were raised about overlooking and the close proximity to existing neighbours at that time. 
I just wonder therefore, Chair, if the original planning application had included three-storey properties and the higher elevations we see today, if approval would have been granted at that time. No one can say, but I'm sure the debate on the elevations and the three-storey properties, which to my mind are out of keeping in a village environment, would have been rigorously debated. When this application was considered by the Paris Council, there was genuine concern about both the overlooking issues with the elevation and the visual impact of three-storey properties. Accepting that there are always concerns and issues by residents who find that the open space next to them is to be de developed. But I understand that there is an acceptance of the 52 units. You know, the additional 52 homes bring benefits. It brings sustainability and viability of services within the village, including the school, etc. Consequently, had the additional homes been built to the original design plans, there would have been an acceptance and we wouldn't have been here today. In accepting the principle of the development of the 52 homes, what is left to consider is how they sit within the village, in particular, their relationship with adjacent properties and what is reasonable and what is unreasonable. The original design and layout was considered reasonable by the planning committee at the time. However, I believe, and so do many residents, including the parish council, that the amended layout and design is unreasonable. And therefore the planning application being considered here today should be refused. Furthermore, I understand that latest plans in front of you today are already out of date. For example, it is believed that some of the rules are even higher than those indicated on the plans. Finally, Chair, the plans and drawings of elevations do give you the technical detail, but really you can only get a true perspective of the adverse impact of this development when you see it from neighboring properties. And to understand the residents' objections, I suggest a site visit would be beneficial, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. The last speaker on this application is Councillor Walker, who is a neighbouring ward member. Councillor Walker, you two have five minutes to address the committee. And Mr. Wiley will give you a warning when 30 seconds remains and your time starts when you start speaking. Thank you, Chair. Now, the principle of this development is absolutely fine. The outline showed a good mix of dwellings, pleasantly sustainable for the village population with central green space a good development for local families, but that is not what is being built. The variation before committee today would produce a very different beast, a mix of dwellings more suited to Airbnb than family life in a village, an absolute domination of the existing bungalows on Woodcock Road, a determination to build for maximum profit regardless of permissions, and a complete disregard for the responsibilities to the community. I voiced concerns at the huge difference in levels at the planning meeting in April, and they've been very well expressed again here today. So I will turn to the family and community issues. And an, an essential part of developing a community is the provision of outdoor space and children's play areas. And this council is fortunate to have detailed planning advice and documentation to assist developers. Could I refer you to the report by the Open Space Consultation Group on this application? It details the play space and equipment which would be required here. The accompanying Open Space Supplementary Planning document is clear that a central space with no more than gentle slopes and being secure by design is what is wanted here. What is proposed in this variation is completely different from the indications of central, sorry, central green space on the earlier plans. We are now offered a narrow strip of land alongside the public right of way, which has substantial slopes and absolutely no central aspect at all. 
the security offered by being visible from multiple homes is sacrificed as this essential community resource is pushed away from view and literally sidelined. This is indicative of the cavalier attitude to responsibilities in all aspects of this development. Please also note that the essential play area has been relegated to the final phase. And I must ask, how confident are you that this developer will ever deliver a suitable play area equipped to the specifications in that supplementary planning document? To be clear, I can find no evidence that this development will be delivered to plan but plenty of evidence that ongoing sequence of retrospective applications will seek to legitimize what is a wholly unacceptable and reckless development. It won't surprise you that I will urge refusal. Given that this succession of plans have failed to describe what is actually happening on site, and if committee were hesitant to rely on them to refuse this application today, then I am confident that a visit to the site will confirm uh, the magnitude of the variations and will leave committee in no doubt. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Walker. That's all our speakers for this application, so we'll now open it to the floor. I have Councillor Copsey wishing to speak first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've listened to Mr Moore, I've listened to Councillor Matthews, and I've listened to Councillor Walker all ask the same thing. They've all asked for us to have a site visit to this. So I move we go straight to deferring this for a site visit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Coxey. Councillor Rudd. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I would second that. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, the committee has a look at this in detail. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Councillor McMaster. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This uh, developer obviously historically has blatant disregard for any rules and regulations. I know legally we have to assess this on its merits and make a decision. If it's not possible for us to issue an order to halt further development until the site visit, then I, then I move refusal if we cannot halt further development until we receive a site visit. Look at planning offices in terms of enforcement, can that development be halted whilst an application is active? Mr Chatfield. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, um, in terms of, yeah, but, no, in terms of that, that wouldn't necessarily be a, be a reason for it, but we couldn't, we, in terms of enforcement, we, we can certainly, um, we can certainly issue warnings um, and we can explain that the developments um, would be seen at, at clearly the developer's own risk. And we couldn't ask for it to be deferred and, and we couldn't give a reason for refusal for planning permission on the grounds that they wouldn't stop they wouldn't stop development that is not a material planning reason for refusal councillor mcmaster would I'm, you gonna, like... I'm gonna move refusal anyway thank you chair what what, what are your grounds um i'll think of something and i'll come back i'll come back to you at the end then uh councillor meredith wishing to come in next Thank you, Chair. I have a lot of sympathy for Councillor Master's point of view, especially having heard the objector and the, uh, the two area councillors there. What I would say is that the more the developer does, without currently having planning permission for it, the more risk they undertake. Now, I lost a pen in here from Napoleon's as recently as yesterday, but I'm not that much of a gambler, uh, and I can't imagine anybody with an ounce of common sense would be. So I'm happy to support the deferral because we have an unfortunate but rare opportunity to look at something in situ, not having to use our imaginations, which again was something I wasn't blessed with. So I think a deferral and a site visit is the best approach, despite seeing the logic of Councillor McMaster's point of view, I will be supporting Councillors Rudd and Copsey. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Councillor Wilkinson, you wish to come in? Yeah, I think most of it's been said, so I won't reiterate, but I think there are too many questions here. Um, and I reiterate what um, Councillor Meredith said, um, that it would be a unique opportunity for us to be able to see some of the um, houses in situ. So I will absolutely support um, a site visit. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Do any of the members wish to speak on this application? Councillor Healy? Has, has a, I don't know if Councillor McMaster has uh, thought of his reasons for potential refusal yet. 
but overlooking a visual impact would, would certainly be amongst them. And I would second that because I think we, well, for, for a start, we've seen this developer blatantly disregard the planning permission that they've already been given. The site visit allows them to continue to blatantly disregard it. I think we need to send strong messages to, to these developers. Uh, as, as the objectors have said, and the ward councillors have, um, uh, have said, um, it's a different style, it's different bricks, it's different roofing, it's different style, it's higher. Uh, they're towering 1.3 metres over the existing properties. You know, they're, they're making a mockery, really, of the whole thing. I think we have got strong grounds for refusal. And if Councillor McMaster is still going to put that forward, I would second it. <laughs> Councillor Mass, are you happy with those reasons? Yes, Chair, thank you. Yeah, my, my reasons would be uh, the impact on the neighbours amenities given the overbearing nature of the development and the visual amenities of the materials used. It's not in keeping. Right. Do any of the members wish to speak on that app, this application? No. Well, I mean, I for me, I think this is a complete mess is that, you know, we've had this to committee more than once now with different plans saying this, different plans saying that. And we've just heard from Councillor Matthews that even these most, up to, well, supposedly most up-to-date plans are allegedly not accurate either. So I think really the developer needs to get their act together. So for me, I don't feel comfortable voting on it either way because I don't know what I'm voting on, as I believe Councillor Meredith in his, in his roundabout way explained. Um, so we can't for talk me, about roundabouts, Chair. So for me, I will be supporting the site visit because I just, we don't know what, what the plans before us are right, wrong. We don't know what, what's going on. So I want to get on the ground and have a look for myself. As I said earlier on another application, I always find site visits to be so much so useful, particularly when there's question marks about what, what is what and how it affects people. So I'll be supporting the site visit. Uh, I'm sorry, can I just clarify that, Councillor Healy, you're happy with that additional reason for refusal of being out of character as well for the proposal for refusal? Um, Mr. Wanner, we have two proposals, one for a site visit and one for refusal. Do we need to take the refusal first? Okay. So we have a proposal for... Oh, Miss Purse. just wanted to know um, from, from the councillors that have moved refusal, just um, which properties they feel are going to be impacted, particularly by the, uh, the development. Pardon me, I couldn't hear you. Which properties you feel are going to be affected? The, the, Which, the properties that, that on the first line of development closest to the neighbours, Woodcock Road, is it? Yeah, southern boundary. The property, well, the properties where the current land levels aren't what were previously historically approved. I think is that acceptable, Councillor Master and Councillor Healy? Yeah. So we have that proposal from Councilman Master, seconded by Councilor Healy, to refuse the application on the grounds of overlooking and visual impact, uh, reducing the uh, residential amenity of the properties on Woodcock Road, and also because the development is out of character with Flamborough. So all those in favour of that motion, please raise your hand. Four, Chairman. All those against. Seven chairman. Therefore, that motion falls. So we move to the second motion, which is proposed by Councillor, I can't read my own writing now, Councillor Rudd, and seconded by Councillor Cops. Cops. No, no, it's proposed by Copsey, seconded by Rudd, sorry. Couldn't read my own handwriting. Uh, for a site visit. All those in favour of a site visit. Nine chairman. All those against. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Two chairs. Therefore, that is deferred for a site visit. Um, are members happy because Councillor Jefferson has sent her apologies, so it's no longer speaking on item nine, that we bring item 10 forward because I'm conscious there's a couple of members of the public here would like to probably get out of this hot oven a bit quicker. Um, this is the item, as I declared in my interest, that as a ward member, I, I've been campaigning against the prison, so I will not be sitting in on this agenda item and I'll be handing over the chair to Councillor McMaster. However, in line with my advice from Democratic Services, I will address the committee as a ward councillor now, then I will leave the room.
So members of the committee, I think firstly, the principle of this application, I don't have a massive issue with. I think in terms of getting lorries off of the road, this will actually improve the residential amenity of the residents of Fulsut and, and Fangfoss. However, there are a couple of outstanding issues which I think are, are a major problem, particularly for the uh, nearest dwelling, the property of Mr. Edwards, who is actually here in the chamber with us, which will damage his residential immunity if not addressed by you today. The first of these is that the 2.8 metre high hoarding, which is proposed by the MOJ to protect the closest property from um, both visual and noise and um, dust pollution. There are two gaps in that proposed hoarding, one of which is very close to Mr. Mr. Edwards' property, which are for gates because the farmer requires to maintain access to, to part of the field. Now the gates proposed under the plans are mesh gates and therefore have no way of stopping dust and sand and things blowing through and also no way of stopping noise coming through, unlike the rest of the hoarding. So what I would request members is that you request that those gates actually are solid gates to therefore reinforce the usefulness of the hoarding in protecting the residential immunity of Mr. Edwards. Secondly, anyone who's actually been to the full Sutton site will see that the current prison site, so the current prison, proposed new prison site is surrounded by this 2.8 meter high hoarding currently, and it's bright white. So it's not particularly very good at supporting the local landscape and protecting residential amenity from the impact of this development. So considering this new hoarding will be around 20 meters from Mr. Edwards' front door and house, I request that you require the new hoarding as part of this soil storage application to be a more subtle color than bright white. Obviously green or something along those lines would be better for the green environment and landscape that's already there. Uh, thirdly, the closest part of the proposed soil bund and soil storage area to Mr. Edwards' dwelling is currently, as I said, about 20, I think 22, 23 metres away from his front door. Now, there is, I believe, right from reading the officer's report, a proposal that that section will be five metres further away, five metre in, inlet in the soil bund, although I haven't seen a condition securing that. Um, I would request that that's actually made larger than, than five metres because that does not, 27 metres from an area where there'll be dumper trucks uh, delivering soil and other things is not particularly great for someone trying to live. And of course, all the people who work on Mr. Edwards' site as well in terms of, again, residential amenity with noise impact and potential dust impact as well. And then finally, members, I think in line with a informative which... Um, members put on the reserve matters application, which was approved a few months ago by this committee, I would request that some form of soft landscaping is included as part of this too, preferably tree planting outside of the hoarding along the existing hedgerow, uh, which bought boundaries Mr. Edwards site on the Western boundary. Obviously, because this is a temporary application, the committee can only condition that to be temporary landscaping. But again, in line with the informative, which requires the MOJ to try and seek permanent landscaping on this field, I'd ask that the committee again adds an informative to try and make those trees, which I hope you will condition as part of this application, a permanent feature, again, to increase the protection to Mr. Edwards and his family's residential amenity in terms of protecting from noise, visual impact, and again, any sort of dust pollution. That is my short speech, and I will now hand over the chair to Council McMaster, and I will leave the room, and please someone remember to bring me back in after you finish debating this. Thank you, members. Okay, good afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Councillor McMaster. I've been a member of the committee for a while, a bit rusty about uh, chairing it, but I'll do my best. Um, and I'm trying to come off my high excitement from the last one. So, and I thought I had a break in between, but not. I'm going to ask officers for an update, please, before we proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, this application seeks temporary consent for the use of a field adjoining the prison development for the storage of, of soil to a height of two meters whilst the development is being carried out. 
The soil is then, is then to be removed and used to construct the bond surrounding the, the prison complex, the, the bond that the members were, were quite keen was being provided. Uh, the site access will be from the prison site via new temporary crossing over the ditch, and as such, it would not result in additional lorry movements on the public highway. If the material were to be deposited on, the, on an alternative site away from, away from the prison, um, it's estimated this could result in an, an additional 5,000 additional lorry movements on the local road network. Um, amended plans, as, as mentioned by Councillor Hammond, have been received, which, which do show a 2.8 metre high hoarding to be provided around, around the site. Uh, further to that, we've had um, Stamford Bridge Parish Council confirm they have no objections to the scheme. And with regard to the conditions, um, officers suggesting that um, just further clarification with regard to um, condition two, the working hours between eight and six, Monday to Friday, eight and one on Saturdays with no work on Sundays or bank holidays. And also with additional conditions to, res to uh, restrict the development to a temporary period as, as applied for, and to ensure that land and is restored and hoarding removed within, the, within four years of the commencement of development. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Matthew Edwards, whose house and business are immediately adjacent to the proposed soil storage area, has asked me to speak on his behalf today. The front door of Mr. Edwards' house lies just 23 meters away from the site. He, his family, and those working in his business just a few meters further away will be severely affected by the noise and dust generated by the movement of 100,000 cubic meters of soil so close to his property. We understand the rationale for storing this soil locally rather than transporting it elsewhere by lorry. However, Mr. Edwards is going to pay a heavy price for this. And we ask the planning committee to consider four mitigations that will reduce the impact on him and his family, as well as on the wider community. These are increasing the distance between the soil heap and Mr. Edwards' house, either covering the mesh gates or alternatively making them solid, um, particularly the mesh gate adjacent to Mr. Edwards' house. There is also one adjacent to Moor Lane, which, which we would ask also be uh, covered. Tree planting along the western boundary of, of the site and the use of green rather than white hoarding around the site. I would now like to consider each of these options in more detail starting with the possibility of increasing the distance between the soil heap and Mr. Edwards' property. The proposed storage field reaches a triangular point in front of Mr. Edwards' house. If this triangular area was left untouched outside the hoarding, it would create a buffer zone between Mr. Edwards' property and the soil store. If the boundaries of the buffer zone were 20 meters long, the area of the field available for soil storage would be reduced by just 200 square meters. Redistributing the soil that would otherwise have been stored in this area will increase the height of the remaining soil heap by about one inch. This will not be noticeable, but it would afford Mr. Edwards some extra distance between the diggers and dumpers and the dust and the noise that will be generated by the on-site working. Secondly, although it is not shown on the submitted plans, the agent indicated last night that there are to be two mesh gates at both ends of the farmer's six meter wide access track along the western edge of the field. One will be directly opposite Mr. Edwards' house and the other will open onto Moor Lane. During construction, sandy soil will blow directly through the gates onto Mr. Edwards' house and the road. Ideally, as Councillor Hammond has stated, these gates should be solid and not mesh. If that is not possible, we would ask that the gates be covered um, during the time that the soil heap is being constructed and when it is being uh, de deconstructed. Um, once the soil heap is completed and hydra seeded, the gates can be uncovered at that period to allow them to be opened. But ideally, as Councillor Hammond has stated, it would be much better if they were solid gates and therefore the, the sandy soil would not blow into Mr. Edwards' house and along the road. 
Moving on to tree planting, we would like the committee to consider conditioning the planting of fast growing evergreen trees, including some mature specimens along the western boundary of the site outside the hoarding and immediately adjacent to the existing hedge line. Although such planting would initially represent a temporary landscaping measure, it would offer the potential for significant long term benefit as an additional visual screen for the residents and road users to the west of the new prison. Of course, retaining the trees permanently would require the consent of the landowner. We would ask the committee to request the MOJ negotiate with the landowner with a view to making the trees permanent. Finally, we would ask that green rather than white hoarding be used around the site. Green hoarding will blend in with the surrounding countryside much more effectively to the benefit of local residents, walkers, cyclists, and tourists living in the nearby holiday cottages. We hope that in the spirit of where everyone matters, the planning committee will help the community to live with the consequences of this massive prison build by requiring the suggested mitigations should this application be approved. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. There's been a change in the list of speakers. Instead of Mr. Drew, we have Mr. Hardy, and Mr. Hardy should be joining us on Zoom. Are you there, Mr. Hardy? I am, Chair, yes. And we can hear you loud and clear. When you're, You'll have five minutes to speak, and your time will start when you start, and we'll give you a reminder when you have 30 seconds remaining. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I last presented to this committee uh, when it granted approval of the reserve matters for the new prison. And as part of the approval of the reserve matters, um, the MOJ committed to the provision of a landscape bund on the western and southern sides of the site. Now, the MOJ and its contractor, Keir, have been making progress on the site with a package of enabling works. These will soon be complete and the MOJ will then move into the main construction phase. Uh, the landscape bund will be formed from soil from the new prison site. And the soil to be used from, to form the bund will be removed from the site at the start of the main works and deposited over a relatively short period. And the bund will then be formed towards the end of the project when the soil is moved back. This is done because the MOJ and Keir need all the space available on the site for parking and materials movement to support construction. If the MOJ can't store the material next to the new prison site, it will need to take it away uh, somewhere else to be stored and then bring it back again. And the volume of material involved would mean the transportation of soil away from the site and back again, and that would generate, uh, as Mr. Chatfield explained, somewhere in the order of 5,000 additional HGV movements on the local highway network. So if this application is approved, um, those 5,000 or so HGV trips will be prevented, uh, which the MOJ considers to be a, a significant benefit. We are, of course, conscious of its potential impact on residents, and as committee knows, the MOJ does regularly meet with residents and councillors, uh, ward and parish councillors at monthly stakeholder meetings. And prior to submitting the application, the MOJ shared its proposals with its neighbours and councillors and explained the reasons for wanting to store the soil here. The MOJ and Keir will implement measures to ensure that the works minimise impacts through dust generation. Uh, the stockpiles uh, will be seeded uh, using a technique known as hydro seeding which has already been successfully used on the banks of the new ditch course. The hydro seeding process is designed specifically to allow seeds to stick to irregular surfaces as it uses a gel-like medium. And that gel-like medium also supports germination and the seeds grow, they will bind material and mitigate dust generation. The stockpiles will be enclosed by a 2.8 meter high construction hoarding, uh, meaning the soil piles won't be visible and the dust will not blow through or over it. Uh, and the MOJ and its contractor Keir have also given a commitment to using white noise reversing tones on vehicles. And these are designed to provide a warning to operatives on site who may be close to a vehicle, but for the sound to then quickly dissipate. I'd emphasize again that the, uh, the works uh, are carried out over relatively short periods at the start and the finish of the construction phase. Uh, and that once the material has been taken back onto site, of course, the, the site will be restored to its former state uh, and the fencing will be removed. And the MOJ is in, entirely happy with the temporary consent for a period of four years. Uh, just picking up on one or two of the comments um, 
made by, firstly, by Councillor Hammond and uh, by Miss Roberts. Um, in relation to tree planting, um, the, uh, the land is not owned by the MOJ. Uh, and so um, any planting in the short term, uh, the MOJ couldn't guarantee it would be retained uh, in the longer term. Um, and moreover, uh, this is a four year temporary consent. And so I think we have to consider how effective any landscaping would be um, over that very short term period. Um, in the longer term, of course, this committee has approved reserve matters applications which don't require any additional landscaping uh, to mitigate uh, visual impact of, of the prison. Um, in relation to uh, the colour of the hoarding, uh, my, uh, without taking instructions, I would expect the MOJ to be uh, comfortable uh, with that proposal, certainly in those parts of the hoarding which face on to uh, Mr Edwards' property. Uh, in relation to gates, um, there is a, an issue there in relation to solid gates, which might act as a little bit of a sale in windy conditions and so could represent a health and safety risk. Uh, but I'm sure we could look at how that could be managed, um, at least by way of um, uh, them being temporarily um, covered, uh, if they can't be covered all the time whilst... whilst 30 seconds in. left. Um, so I think... Uh, we could take take a look at that as well. So I, that's really all from me, and I hope those comments have been helpful in ex firstly explaining the reason for the application, um, emphasising that um, if approved, it will have a significant impact in terms of reducing vehicular trips, and um, that the MOJ um, is willing to put in place mitigation measures to protect Mr Edwards' immunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. <clears throat> I, I'll, I'll admit I struggle to hear everything, but I got the gist of most of your um, speech, and I'm pleased to, to hear you, you think this can be achieved. I'm going to open this up to the floor, starting with Councillor Meredith, please. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, but I would be happy if Councillor Rudd wants to speak to defer to him as one of the local ward members and coming after. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Rudd, get off you go. Right, right. Thank you, Chairman. Well, there's no doubt about it that this, this has to be, uh, the, the, it's, it's certainly uh, better that this soil is put uh, where it is. There's no doubt about that. But certainly we have to consider uh, Mr. Edwards. And uh, I, I really, as one of the ward members as well, would support um, the suggestions made by Ms. Roberts and uh, as such uh, to actually, and, and Councillor Hammond, uh, to uh, have these solid gates, which can only be of more benefit, I'm sure, uh, to, uh, to Mr. Edwards and his family. Um, the, the suggestion that, uh, you, you know, the, 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 uh, the fence be uh, coloured green, I think that sounds more sensible than, than white. So I, I would suggest that that be another condition as well. And, uh, and certainly to try and put some more soft, landscaping in, although it might be on a temporary basis, but, you know, at least uh, some negotiations be made to make, to, to try and make sure this can happen. Um, and, uh, and certainly um, if, if, if the, uh, if, if, if the distance can be, you know, increased uh, from the 23 uh, meters from Mr. Edwards is to, to 28 meters, that would be also uh, more helpful. So really, what I'm suggesting is that, yes, quite happy to, uh, to, to go with a recommendation, but also with these extra conditions, uh, because I think that's important that the immunities of, of Mr. Edwards are, are considered. Mr. Hardy has, has yes, covered it. Uh, he has said that we, we, we wish to uh, do everything we can for Mr. Edwards, but I think if we get this type of action into, into play and put us conditions, we can certainly see that they can, uh, that, that it will be carried out. So quite happy to propose deferral with those extra conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rudd. Councillor Meredith, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I'd just like to uh, echo Councillor Rudd there and thank um, Ms. Roberts and Councillor Hammond for doing all the work and importantly, in my case, all the thinking for me. Um, solidifying the gates, I completely understand the, the point of that. There's not much point in preventing the noise and the dust if you then have a hole in the prevention. 
However, I do take on board Mr. Hardy's comments about the potential health and safety aspect, aspect uh, asking planners for advice here. Is it possible to also condition a, a sort of a door stopper anti-slam mechanism there to make sure that they don't become sales or get caught? Um, for you, Chair. Um, possibly not, but what we probably could do is put a condition on the details of um, mitigation measures to be agreed um, with officers. I mean, mention was made um, I'm not sure what it's about with regard to potential covering. That's something that could be considered. There may be other things, but that's the kind of idea rather than anything specific. As I said, the, the important factor there is to make sure that the gates can be as covered as possible without a detriment to health and safety or indeed health and safety preventing that from happening. So anything that can be done there, welcome. Similarly with the painting. I must admit, though, green may not be the best colour and I'll leave this happily in the hands of officers, but I once saw a barn built on the top of a hill and it was painted grey because the sky in England is always grey and as a result it blended in with the background and green would have created a big mound effectively. So what I would say there is could the most appropriate colour based on perspective be please pick? Because whilst I agree completely with the principle of painting, not knowing the area in intimately myself, I don't know if green is the best colour. I'd suggest it probably is, but I wouldn't want to tie your hands in case it's not. Um, the next issue is the, um, the, the buffer zone, as was mentioned by Councillor Road, as one of the preferable conditions. Could we possibly tie that in with the tree planting that's been requested? If there is a greater buffer zone between the edge of the, or the boundary property and the hoarding, surely that in turn creates the space for some, um, some soft planting, which in turn means they don't have to use neighbouring land. Those two issues to me would solve each other perfectly, and uh, as was pointed out by Ms Roberts, would only result in the mund being an inch taller. That seems far preferable to what we see before us. <laughs> Sorry, I'm okay. making James, I'm making Mr Chatfield work for his uh, living today. Okay, thank you, Councillor Meredith. We'll come back to that, um, Mr Ch uh, Chatfield. We're going to Councillor Wilkins. Okay, sorry. To say, I don't know if that would be an informative or a condition. Uh, if it was able to be conditioned, could it be conditioned in such a way that development can't commence or you know, works can't be undertaken until that planting is arranged, either on the neighbouring property or if the buffer zone's in place, then on MOJ land itself? Either way, can they be made to not start work until planting and uh, fencing is addressed? I, you know, cart before the horse, as we discussed earlier, making sure we avoid that. Thank you, Chair. That is everything now. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Chatfield, what do you like uh, to revert? Th thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. That the, I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the appropriate colour, absolutely, Councillor Meredith, that, that, that's, that we can condition that, 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 that that's fine. Um, in terms of the um, landscaping, that is more problematic. And the, the issue is it's a four-year consent. We're looking for temporary consent here. Um, and in terms of landscaping, it's, you heard the, the agent made a very good point, is actually that they, they would, there's no reason why that, First, first of all, it could take quite a few years for actually that, that, that planting to actually take. Um, and then when it does, it could then start to be removed because the MOJ don't own the land. Um, so the, the, the landscaping is more problematic in terms of a condition. What we could do is put an informative on, requesting that the MOJ in, in, gets involved with discussions with the landowner to secure a more permanent form of screening along there. And maybe may, may be other mechanisms through the, through the council's other arms in terms of tree planting. That potentially could be used in that respect. So, we'd, as, as officers suggest, a condition rather, so an informative rather than a condition, and that that would do that because I think the difficulty with a condition and it's a putting because you're asking for something permanent on a temporary consent, which is which is always always problematic. Sorry, Chair. Just to say that in the year of the tree valley, it would be nice to have some long-lasting benefits from a temporary condition. And in fact, there is money available, grant schemes both locally and nationally for that. So it could actually be done without cost or detriment to either the landowner or to the applicant, in which case, could that information also be provided, please, to make sure that the best possible chance of seeing something done via the informative would be, uh, could be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Chatfield, if we were to condition moving the bunding back to for hypothetically 30 metres from the residence instead of back from the proposed 23, would that enable the tree planting to be on the MOD land or would that still be on the farmer's land? It will be on the farmer's land. The, the, the MOD own the land around, which is essentially to the west, to the west of the site, to the issue, so, sorry, 
to the eastern side, which is around the prison itself. And this is adjacent farmland. So moving the bund back won't actually improve the landscape, the, the, the landscape in there. The landscape in bund actually is, the way what happens is the material has been scraped off the land to form a bund. And that, what's actually happening is that bund is, is being provided in place. And that's, and the agent was saying, that's gonna be what they call hydro seeded. It basically means it's a very fast action, very quick taking. It doesn't have to wait. It's not seasonal dependent. And that will be grass. So actually what's been created will be a, a, the first thing to do is actually create a landscape bund. And it's within that area that material will then be brought on for the prison. And then effect that process is reversed. So all the material is taken off and the bund will then be restored back. But so the first process to go on is actually to create a bund adjacent to the to neighboring properties, which is to be seeded. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, please. Uh, thank you, Chet. Yes, I, um, I think most of what I was going to say have already been discussed. Um, uh, I would like to thank the representative of the Ministry of Justice uh, to, um, for acceding to most of the stuff that the, uh, that the object has been asking for. Um, if I may put on my health and safety hat again <laughs> and just mention that I, I've done a number of assessments in quarries for British Gypsum and, and they have the same issue with gates and dust blowing and what they use is a, a green netting that goes across. It's pretty straightforward. You can see through it, but it doesn't allow dust to go through. Uh, and I'm sure that the MOJ could get that um, and that would resolve the issue uh, for them. Um, other than that, um, I, I've got nothing to add on what's already been said. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. I think they refer to it as shade cloth. I might, I'll stand corrected, but I think it's called shade cloth. Anybody else would like to speak? No? Okay. So um, I have Councillor Rudd moving approval subject to conditions, but I, didn't, I don't recall a second. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Meredith has second, seconded the approval subject to the four conditions. And can I ask Mr. Wiley just to run through those four conditions for us, please? I just need to check with the planning officers, Chairman, to see which of those elements would be suitable for condition and which would be more suitable for as informatives. I think Ms. Chatfield indicated that the screening would certainly be uh, better worded as an informative, but the other three elements no, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, no, uh, screening potential we, we could be dealt with by, by way of condition. That's just the mitigation measures to, to ensure the screening. And again, with the, with the colouring of the hoarding, both of those are conditions. In terms of the landscaping, uh, that is something which we have problems with. In, sorry, yeah. uh, we have problems with in terms of the temporary nature, as we said. So that would suggest as an informative. And again, in terms of the, the moving of the bundles, because in terms of it, that's not the scheme that's before members to be considered today. Um, the bund is eventually going to be a landscaping bund and that's 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 its purpose so that that's something but with the other measures in place in terms of the additional screening with the with the gate opening being being secured from that basis plus with the, the hoarding being painted green as well so that that again does move it forward in, in terms of what's been requested uh, thank you mr chatfield are we all um okay with what we're voting on okay so by show of hands can I ask for a show of hands for those who are going to uh, vote approval subject to the conditions we've just spoken about? It's 10, Chairman. 11, isn't it? Oh, 10, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, sorry. Yes, that uh, just to confirm that has been unanimously approved subject to the conditions discussed. Thank you. Okay, members, we now move on to agenda item number nine, um, which is the variation of condition 27 at the wind farm at Withenwick. Can we have the officer's update, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this proposal will increase the length of the turbine blades from 41 to 43.5 metres and the rotor diameter from 82 to 87 metres and the tip height from 111 to 113.5 metres. Uh, the purpose of the proposal is to improve renewable energy yield from the wind farm, although the capacity of the wind farm would remain the same as originally approved. 
Planning permission for the same proposal was granted in December 2018, but was not implemented for a number of reasons, including the uncertainty regarding Brexit and COVID, uh, and the impact that this had on the, on the funding of the proposed development that the applicant has, has confirmed is now in place. Uh, planning permission for the wind farm and its extension were granted on appeal by the uh, planning inspectorate some years ago. Uh, members deferred this application at the last planning committee meeting on the 26th of May for further discussions uh, with the applicants regarding residential amenity, following which the applicant has resubmitted to the committee, following which this application is now, is now resubmitted to the committee for determination. Since the last planning committee meeting, discussions have taken place between the applicants and the local residents who raised the, the objections to the uh, applications. Since publication of the planning committee report, the, the resident has also confirmed in a letter that his concerns are being addressed by the applicant and has subsequently withdrawn his objection referred to in the planning committee report. Councillor Jefferson had hoped to speak to the planning committee, but due to, due to another matter has been unable to make this meeting. Councillor Jefferson would like to thank the planning committee members for deferring this application at the last planning committee meeting and the applicant and the applicant for their cooperation, understanding and engagement to resolve the concerns of the local residents. So to, to such an extent that they are addressed and the resident's object, objection has now been withdrawn. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright. We have no speakers on this application, so I'll open it straight up to members and I'll bring in Councillor Whittle, the local ward member. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, I think uh, it speaks for itself, really. It's uh, very good news, and it speaks very well for this planning committee. Because when I first brought this to the committee, uh, I did say at the time that you probably thought I'd all gone mad bringing up a tiny little matter like this uh, as a committee which usually discusses wind farms and housing estates and anaerobic digesters and all the rest of it. But I think it stands testament and proof that we as a committee can take on board the, um, the concerns and fears of all our residents. And I, I would join with Councillor Jefferson in thanking members of this committee for not only listening to what we had to say and sympathising with the resident, but also to acting and deferring it uh, and dispatching the officer's hot foot to uh, converse with the applicants. And I think that uh, the meeting today also, Chair, has uh, confirmed this uh, view of the Planning Committee when we looked at the issue of Mr Edwards uh, at Full Sutton. And uh, again, I think it's a good thing that the human nature of the planning, planning process can be uh, looked at and understood by the public. So uh, I'm not making any proposals. Well, obviously I'll propose approval uh, on the understanding that Mr Mars has been uh, fully satisfied and has withdrawn his objection. So I'll move approval, Chair, but mostly it's to thank the committee for their actions. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. I've got Councillor Wilkinson. Um, yes, I fully concur with what Councillor Whittle has said now that the, uh, uh, the change um, uh, from um, the objector um, been satisfied with what's going on and the fact that there's already, uh, already a, the principle of this wind farm here. Um, I'm fully endorse um, that and will be um, supporting the application now. Were you seconding there, Councillor Wilkinson? I'm seconding. Councillor Coultish. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it was obviously a unanimous decision last time and I think uh, words of Councillor Whittle, Councillor Jefferson and Councillor Wilkinson speak for themselves that, that we, we do have a certain amount of weight in what we say here and, and I think we're always amenable to listen to developers or, or companies that, and I think it, it speaks volumes that this one was willing to listen to us as well. Uh, we should work together for the benefit of residents um, and and so I'm happy to see it and I, I will vote in favour. However, I did say, I did ask at the last committee for clarification on whether the increased yield from this turbine will increase the proportionate um, contribution to a wind farm fund. Can we have clarification on that, please? So Wayne, right? I know it's not a planning matter, but do we, for information, know? I, I can't honestly answer that with any degree, because I, I know that the, 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 the 106 agreement, it's not a 106 agreement, the agreement that was set quite a number of years ago in terms of the yield, 
Um, th what the yield does, it, it, it depends how the agreement's been written, whether the yield will result in subsequent increase. I don't think, to my knowledge, that the yield difference would actually result in a greater degree of community benefits. I think this was set out originally. Um, um, but I can get back to you, Councillor, if, if that's the, if, if you need that information. Councillor Coulty. Thank you. It, it's, more, it's more of a matter of interest. Uh, like I said at the last committee, uh, obviously the reason they're going to do that is for profit, whether it has other benefits or not. That's obviously the motivation behind that. And, and when we approve wind farms, we expect a contribution to a wind farm fund to compensate residents for having that in their area. I just wondered if, if a, a wind farm could come forward with tiny turbines and then increase it at a later date without having to increase their contribution to a wind farm fund. Chair, I think, I think it's, I mean, it's quite clear when we were dealing with wind farms many, many years ago now, it's probably about seven or eight years ago, that the, the government were very clear that, that, the, that we couldn't, the planning committee and officers could not request a, a contribution effectively. That was effectively taken outside the, the planning box, so to speak, and it was, a, it was offered by the developer. Now, this wind farm was granted on appeal probably back in 2008, I think it was. It's some years ago now, so... I don't know because I did the inquiry at the time. So I think it, I think at that particular time that that's when the agreements were coming together to actually set out. But it was a couple of years later when basically we, the government said that you cannot ask for that. It's got to be offered effectively. Um, and I know that a number of inquiries that um, applicants, when members had refused an application, they weren't offering um, the, these community funds. So in terms, we've got a group of people. There's people in the council who distribute the funds um, in the rural team. Um, so they're, they're probably the best person to speak to in terms of this particular particular fund and any other funds as well. So, yes. Thank you, Mr. Wainwright. Do any of the members wish to speak on this application? No. Well, I completely agree with what everyone else has said. I think this is a good win for the planning committee and a good win for local residents. And I think it shows, you know, I said at full council yesterday that where we can, we'll always do all we can with our powers to support residents. So happy to support the motion put forward by Councillor Whistle and Councillor Wilkinson for approval. That is the motion. That's quite a simple one for once. The first one today out of out of ten. Um, all those in favour of approval. That's all eleven, Chairman. That application is therefore approved. That's our applications for today. The next agenda item is the list of future planning applications, pages one hundred ninety-seven to one hundred ninety-eight of our packs. I think most of them are asterisked for site visits, but. There's two, two which are not. Do members feel the need for site visits on those applications? No, I, I don't think there's a driving need from what I can see of the explanations there. So I think we're no, no, no additions this today for once. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, our asphalt plant from earlier. Sorry, Councillor Meredith. Do you think we could ask the uh, people in Flamborough to build a tarmacking asphalt plant so that when you do the site visit there, you can do two birds with one stone? I don't think that Flamborough would be too happy about that or anyone else. <laughs> Councillor Coulsish. Thank you, Chairman. Just simply because I've been asked by several residents, when can we expect the application that was approved against officers' recommendations at Western Area last week, the application for flats in Gull, when can we expect that as strategic? I think we'll have to look at the, uh, the work programme and get back to you on that, Councillor Bultish. Uh, Councillor Healy. Just, can we ask for clarification of the dates of the site visits as soon as possible? If that's okay. Well, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Wiley will send out the dates once all the site visits are arranged. Yeah, thank you. Right then, so that just leads me to the last agenda item, which is any other business from the chair, which I have one thing to say, and that is say a big thank you to Mr. Wainwright for all the time we served this committee and worked for this council, because this is sadly his last committee meeting. We will greatly miss you. Yeah, th thanks very much, Chair. I mean, it's been a, a tremendous pleasure and an honour, as, as I would say, to serve the committee for Pot Crank. It's nearly... 20, over 20 years now, you know, it's, it's a long time. So I've seen it go through its various iterations, you know, from the PETS committee originally, <laughs> work that one out yourself, to, uh, to various other ones. But I mean, it's, it's uh, we've always had a great relationship with the members. That, that's the main thing. Um, and I know James is, uh, is my uh, successor. So he's here today. So congratulations, James, as well. Um, but no, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, been a 